Christine Brown has a good job, a great boyfriend, and a bright future. But in three days, she's going to podcast. <laughs> is, that, is that the tagline? That's the tagline. She's That's going to podcast. To. She's yeah. going to podcast. Worse it, than hell. A worse fate than hell. A worse fate than hell. She's going to start a podcast. Horrible. <laughs> what a good tagline, though. It is a good tagline, and it's the bold kind of um, multi-line tagline. So someone's yes. got to stop and pay attention and read yes, for a second. Yes. But but it's worth it. I just feel like when we cover older movies on this podcast, they have taglines that really tell you a story like that. And then any movie from like 1995 on maybe is just like a fucking quip. It's a joke. You know? Yes, of course. But this is a tagline that makes you walk, as you said, closer to the poster and go, what's going on here? And they're telling you a whole little story. And look, spoiler, right off the bat, it's maybe the greatest aspect of this movie that it fulfills the promise of the title <laughs> and that tagline fully. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing with this movie, right? It's yes. it's a promise fulfilled pretty much from minute one. Promise but of it's the also- premise... It the promises label on the something bottle. very simple, and yeah, and that's what it delivers. That's that's right. why that's why it felt revolutionary, right? People, Cause, are, cause, people are like, is there more to this? Where's the B plot? I don't understand. Right. They're like, they're like <laughs> lifting up the rug, they're, you know, or whatever. They're like looking in the the kitchen shelves. Like, come on, there's there's something else. No, no, there's nothing else going on. No. Also, like five minutes before it ends, you're like, I'm a fucking idiot for taking the title literally. Of course, that's just an evocative title. That's a thing they call the movie. <laughs> Who cares? I uh, whatever. And then, who? It what? I mean, I don't want to be too hyperbolic here, but it, in that sense, it's kind of one of the greatest endings of all time. <laughs> Just how abruptly it fucking pulls the rug out from you, does the most extreme thing, and ends. Yeah, I mean, spoiler alert: she gets dragged to hell. It is the she ending. Get, I mean, the best, the best last minute of a horror movie that I can remember. Like truly, recent, I yeah, I yeah. really think so. Yeah, because there are other horror movies that play this game of like, whoo. It's all okay. We're in the clear. We're in the woods. And then usually the worst they do is like you see that the person's still alive. Michael Myers comes back for one last stab That's or whatever. The thing. You, you know? know, you can do the carry ending where you jolt someone to send them home, you know, laughing, right? Mm-hmm. And that's fine. But this is I don't know. This feels more of a like the more like it's breaking the rules. Where it's like, surprise, unhappy ending. Credits. Right. Go away. Right. <laughs> title again and title then credits. Card. Yeah, title, yeah, title card. card. Goodbye. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing more. I do I do remember the first time seeing this movie, I was like, oh, there's I like getting kind of like annoyed at the end. I was like, she's not even get, we're not even gonna get her get like tea. Like I thought at least we were gonna see her, you know, foot dragged to hell or like she's gonna be partially dragged to hell and then escape. Mm-hmm. Right. But with two minutes left on the run town, like she hasn't even did I say on the run town? Yeah. On, <laughs> on the run time. Come on down to run town. Or I think maybe <sighs> I thought that like the the villain was going to pop out of a train because they're at a train station. It would be like one of those corny endings where you just like the Michael Myers, like, and there she, and there she is. I wonder Here's if someone will get dragged to hell. Because I had never seen this movie before. <gasps> I thought because wow. she had gifted the button kind of inadvertently to Justin Long by like leaving it behind in his car. That he would that get dragged. He was going right. to get dragged to hell. Right. Is that what's implied? Is he going to get, did she successfully gift it or is the curse now null because, because she got dragged she, to hell? I think the and... curse is null. I think it's not a ring situation where it's going to keep going. Right. No. No. But right. I, 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 and I mean this with absolutely no offense to Mr. Justin Long, who we will, I'm sure, discuss. But had that been the ending, right? He was like, mm-hmm. by the way, I have the button. And then he gets dragged to hell. The audience just burst into cheers, right? Like, I, and I don't yeah. mean that in a mean way. I just feel like I was like, ah, ha, 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 right? I, like, that I, would be the. You know, right? I, I want to give him credit. I think he is perfectly deployed here. And I think yes. he understands how this yeah. movie is using him. I agree. I, I agree. I th- but I think it's another incredible thing about this movie that it's like, this is the stock character that exists in all of these films that's like the boyfriend that's a little too glib, a little too jokey. And this movie somehow frames him perfectly where it's like, 
this character isn't annoying to the audience. This guy is annoying in the universe he's in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, sure, like, sure. It, I just feel yeah. like you're just constantly like, dude, you're just being a little disrespectful in every scene. Do you always need to make it into a joke? Yeah. Like, I, I, it feels, it, it felt kind of like a cool. I mean, I guess subtle's not a word you can really attribute to this movie in any way. But I think <laughs> it's like using this, the same kind of uh, qualities that would be attributed to Justin Long in past movies as likable. Right. Um, and actually in this same year, because I think this is the same year as he's just not that into you. Yeah. Where yes. he's playing a similar character, but in the universe mm. of that movie, we love him and he's hilarious. And he, yeah, ends up dating what? Jennifer Goodwin or something? Gen- Jennifer? Jennifer Goodwin. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. God, what a disaster. God. He was in seven, eight, eight movies and a cameo in Funny People in 2009. Okay, wait, can we do the movies? list? Can we do the list? Can we do the list? Can we try we to can. do the list? Yeah, okay. some of them are, you know, smaller. So, drag me to hell. He's just not that into you. He's in yeah. Redo, the fake movie in Funny People where Adam Sandler R- turns into right. a baby. Right, oh, right, right. Okay. That's his cameo. Right. Yeah. Um. There has to be a Vince Vaughn movie that year, 2009. Is he in a Vince Vaughn movie that year? Uh, not that I'm, not that I'm seeing. No, I th- feel like Vince would always flip no. him a scene. No, the other ones are a bunch of garbage. Oh well, I would I would say that there's one outlier in there. What? Which is? You got the squeakwell in there. You do oh. have the squeak. Prizing the role of squeak of of. <laughs> he's he squeak- squeakwell himself. Of Mr. Squeak. <laughs> yeah. He's squeakalizing his performance in the original film. Yeah. Wait, who and who are the Justin other Long chipmunks? As the squeakwell. Who are the other chipmunks? Yeah, who Justin Long as Alvin. Jamie, right. I don't want to cut you off here. I I can see you're excited to share the news. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, okay. Here we go. Uh, let's see. We've got. Uh, well, who are? Is it? Uh, Zachary Levi. Is, he he's he's the replacement he for Dave Seville. He's he's uh, Dave's like cousin or whatever. Jesse okay. McCartney is yes Theo. Theodore and mm. Matthew Gray Goobler of Criminal mm-hmm. Minds. Of course, is Simon. <laughs> yes, he is. And then I believe the Chipettes are Applegate, mm-hmm. Polar, and Ferris. That's right. That's right. Wow! Incredible. A's yeah, across the board. I, I regret bringing up Long's 2009 because it's actually a bunch of garbage. The other movies are Serious Moonlight, the Long, uh, the the movie, the Adrian Shelley script oh, that wow. Cheryl okay. Hines directed. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Apparently, he has a small role in Still Waiting, the the waiting sequel. Uh, that's generous of him <laughs> to come back <laughs> uh, reprise his role. He's in a rom com called Terrible Sequel. To- <laughs> Still waiting. Yeah. He's in a rom com called Taking Chances with Emmanuel Shakiri. Is that how you what? say his name? Sh- 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 Shuri- mm, sh- sh- yeah. Shiriqui. Sh- sure. How do you say your name? I'm sorry. I apologize, Emmanuel. Yeah. I don't know how to say your last name. Um, he was in something called Beyond All. No, that doesn't count. Uh, he was a voice in Planet 51 oh, with sure. The Rock. Uh-huh. Oh. Mm-hmm. And apparently, Griffin, and you can confirm this for me, he was in Old Dogs, a small role in Old Dogs. Oh, oh. Uh, the not Walt only Becker is, film. Uh-huh. Not only is he in Old Dogs, I would argue he's the best performance in Old Dogs. Well, there you go. This is a big part and of my thing. uncredited. Th- yeah, it's kind of rude. He should, he should be first built. <laughs> he's like the only guy in Old Dogs who understands how to thread the needle, know exactly what movie he's in. I think he's very funny in Old Dogs. But yes. Uh, uh, this this is a, a really interesting, I think, subversion of just, hey, Justin Long, can you do what you're doing in every other movie, but can we change the context around you to make you seem uh, just, like, insufferable? Um, and yes, having him be dragged to hell at the end of the movie would be, like, the satisfying thing to the audience. But uh, but I'm not unhappy that... No. What is no, her name? No. Christine she should have been dragged, got to, dragged hell. to hell. That should have been... Hap- that should have happened... <laughs> And uh, that should have been the inciting incident, honestly. <laughs> there is, I mean, look, we're getting deep into it really early before we've introduced the show uh, or our guests. But there's a bloody <laughs> disgusting interview that Sam Raimi did like three years ago, a retrospective on this movie. And uh, they, it, the first, it, William Bibiani was the interviewer. And he asked her if he thought she deserved it. And he said, uh, 
Uh, no, I feel the poor girl was over punished as it happens in life sometimes. It's a morality tale. She did do the wrong thing, but holy cow, give her a break. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said, but that's how this particular tale ends. And then this is like the whole movie in a nutshell for me. He said, I thought it would be shocking to title the film Drag Me to Hell and actually end it with giving exactly what the title demanded and still make it incredibly shocking. I thought that would be a really funny cocktail. I mean, I, I mean, right. I don't disagree. Yeah. I would have left disappointed if no one, if not a single person got dragged to hell. Yeah. Um, but then the interviews, I was reading interviews he did in 2009, and he seems to really feel that she w deserved it in 2009. But with the with the benefit of time, he maybe changed. It was weird. He gave a couple interviews where he, he says that she should have been dragged to hell, which I'm inclined to agree with. But then the reasons he gives, I was like, oh, well, that's not the reason I thought, you know, it's uh, it's open. He thought she should be dragged to hell because she was like. Uh, a good person on the outside, but when you really start to look at her, the real person comes out. But it made it sound like it was more connected to, like, he, I, the context of it is he's talking about her more like she's like an L.A. phony. Like, she huh. moved from a farm and she changed. I was like, well, that's not why I disliked her. No. That's why he doesn't like, like her? <laughs> there are so many reasons to dislike that character. But yeah. it's like, it sounded more connected to, like, oh, she's an L.A. phony. It's like, well... I get like yeah. <laughs> she but does have a very that, nice not... place in Echo Park or whatever. Yes, but I, oh I'm not God. sure how she yeah, can afford. That was, yeah, she. Well, it, he's but, it's know. his lease. It has to. It's be, right, 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 right. It's him with the, the rich <laughs> and, family. Sure, and his parents right. are paying for she it. She did yeah. leave her um her pork queen or whatever what was it called <sighs> the pork queen fair legacy behind. She moved to L. A. Now she's mm -hmm. a cog in the corporate machine sure and that and that's why i hate her yeah yeah that's that's where i was like there's so many good reasons to want her to be dragged to hell but that just wasn't on my list wild <laughs> she, she she you know we'll talk about it and griff you should probably introduce the podcast or whatever but um you know this was 2009 this was the height of the recession we were all you mm -hmm. know you know, ready to hate on anyone, you know, who was denying bank loans or whatever and foreclosing on, you know, crazy old ladies. It, it, like that's, that's, yeah, she's, she's, she's the villain. Sort I of. also, yeah, I mean, I think it's part of the magic of this movie is that it's holding two things to be true at the same time, which is she deserves it. And also it's a little bit extreme. Yeah. Well, no one deserves to be, well, I don't know about nobody, but you know, most yeah. people don't deserve to be dragged to hell, I suppose. Right. <laughs> Through but she should at tracks. least be given a talking to maybe, or, you know, I don't know, something like she that. She should be given a stern talking to. I would yeah. drag her boss to hell. I would drag her. I would feel comfortable Pamer? having her boss dragged to hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take if anything, hell, this movie me. makes an argument you could drag four or five different characters to hell. True. Right. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Yeah. Stu? Stu? Take Stu to hell. Yeah, Take Stu to hell. Like, Stu's not you know, great. No, there's a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of strong contenders. Power rankings of who should be dragged to hell. <laughs> In the way that like Broadway shows, you get to end with the catharsis of the cast coming out and taking a bow individually and everything uh it's more movies should like end and then the after credit scene shouldn't be some fucking cookie teasing the next movie it should just be like we're, we agree with you here are the characters we're dragging to hell you just drag a couple characters to hell at the end of every movie whoever the audience really dislikes mm -hmm. that'd be really satisfying introduce yeah. our podcast griffin and our guests sure yeah it's a <laughs> it's a podcast called blank check with griffin and david i'm griffin thanks i'm david thanks and it's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they get dragged to hell, baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an example of someone who did uh, one of the most su financially successful trilogies in history and then was truly given complete creative freedom to make the exact kind of movie he made at the beginning of his career. Uh, right. It's just like a perfect example of a blank check movie on a small scale. Uh, we're talking about Sam Raimi, the films of Sam Raimi. This is the titular, the namesake of mm -hmm. this miniseries, Podcast Me to Hell. We're talking Drag Me to Hell and our guests returning together for the first time. They've both been separate guests, but mm -hmm. from the Bechdel cast, uh, Jamie Loftus and Caitlin Durante. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yes. Yeah. Great to great to be back. Great to be uh, in Thank hell with you guys. Thanks for dragging us uh, into this hell with you. Yeah. yeah. 
we you asked us to do this like three days ago and we're like we don't know uh but we got the buttons in the mail and here we are yep. now you right. have no choice that's yes. how we book yeah. our podcast we send <laughs> buttons send we started sending people buttons button. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, welcome to hell, everybody. Um, this is a movie that is pretty good, in my opinion. There you go. I mean, I'll David, say it. You, you texted me. I did. Your wording was uh, M. Uh, it's like someone made a horror movie for Griffin Newman. I mean, any horror movie where an anvil lands on someone's head, basically, yeah. and then yeah. their eyes pop out. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like that's what you want out of a horror movie. I'm not saying that in a negative way at all. I'm just saying, like, it feels like this is, you know, 100% Griffin Newman. No, energy. you know me well. I mean, yeah. you love uh, kissing in movies. What I love mm. is when a toothless woman sucks on someone's <laughs> lower jaw. <laughs> and Twice. goo comes out. Twice! <laughs> I got to did you so wait no. did, did you guys see this in uh, uh who who saw this in theaters I, I, I guess that's my question mm -mm. I saw it in theaters I did I saw it like I think maybe a year or two after it came out the cuz I and I I'm not you know this is one of the ultimate uh theater experiences I've had as like an adult yeah. like this was just the perfect go to the local regal I saw it at the you know court square or mm -hmm. whatever and just just the absolute astonishment of the audience, the loud astonishment of the audience at, at every gross thing. It was, you know, everyone was just screaming and cheering like pretty much for 99 minutes. And then, and then we all left like happy and chattering. Like it, it was, I, I'm sure exactly the experience Sam Raimi wanted me to have. Uh, it's just a good theater movie. Oh, I'm going to sound like an asshole saying this, but oh when boy. this movie came out, I was doing an acting program in France uh so i Ooh. i know i know okay. i know okay. i know wow i only bring this up to say i saw this in paris and in paris oh. especially moviegoers bonjour. are yeah, uh, bonjour yes Thank you. Uh, uh moviegoers are like very reserved you know there's this whole like oh in paris we appreciate cinema unlike those americans unlike those groveling americans so even when you see like a big dumb american blockbuster in france audiences aren't that loud and reactive even no, for like not. a horror movie mm -hmm. or a comedy or whatever it took like 15 minutes for this audience to break down and then it was just <laughs> absolute oh, like good. screaming and convulsing and all of that yeah it's 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 a lot of fun for that very reason. Well, uh, what do you guys think of Sam Raimi in general? Because uh, yeah, when when we approached you long ago, this is the movie you guys wanted to talk about. But are you guys Raimi fans, Raimi skeptics? I generally like him. I like the first two Spider Man movies. I'm not a huge. Uh, I mean, Evil Dead is 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 fun. Um, you know the Evil Dead one, and then kind of Evil Dead Two is just Evil Dead One again, and then Evil Dead Three is With more some, money. <laughs> is them yeah. is the character time traveling, which is the formula for all trilogies. Yes, and Tur the turtles, for example, precisely turtles in time. Yeah, <laughs> Men in Black, etc. I think right. we talked about this last time I was on the show. Anyway, right. well, that's why you have to come back for a third episode of Blank mm. Check, and then you guys right. can uh, travel through time. That's the time travel episode. Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, you know, I, I like what he I like that he makes bold choices. I like that he stays on brand. Um, do I think his movies are good necessarily? Um, sometimes uh, I don't think Drag Me to Hell is good even a, a little bit. Ooh, Anti-drag. <laughs> me to hell. Caitlin and I. Yeah, Caitlin and I got some got some gripes. Uh, I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not a Raimi completionist at all. I mean, Spider Man Two is truly one of my all time favorite movies of my entire life. Yeah, I've seen it five movie. trillion times. It yeah. uh, informed my sexuality in, a, a, in a very direct way. Oh well, sure. Yeah, right. you're, you're, you're a fan. <laughs> that truly. 
I don't think I'm uh, underselling it when I say that performance. I wasn't even the thinking about my life that, in that, some ways. Right, that movie has to be a Rosetta Stone for you. I mean, there's no <laughs> other movie with that much brightly lit shirtless Molina. Right, <laughs> every other movie where Molina is taking his top off. Oh, and right, is, is more sort of moody up. and shadowy and artsy. Yeah, like species right. or whatever. But yeah, my we only don't, problem we need that with lighting. the Da Vinci Code was that Alfred Molina was wearing too many clothes the so whole time many layers too yeah i mean i like i appreciate the mystery but topless molina uh was was a touchstone for me and so mm. for a while just because i had such a big crush on uh alfred molina i was like sam Raimi's my favorite director because he made alfred molina take his shirt off <laughs> anyways I've been bopping around his filmography for for the the ensuing twenty years. I've seen the Evil Dead's Drag Me to Hell. I think when we were picking this episode was the Sam Raimi movie I'd seen the most recently that wasn't Spider Man Two, mm. and it's it's uh, I I I struggle with this movie uh, because like there's just one like the the treatment of Romani culture is so horrible. And that, like, it makes it just a tough watch in general for yeah. me. But then as a horror movie, like, the the scenes are so goofy. The Roger Rabbit scene. Like, oh. I really <laughs> wish I could have seen the Roger Rabbit anvil drop in theaters. Um, so it's like it this movie incredible. has a lot of what I like about Sam Raimi. And then a lot of, like... A lot of stuff that I was like, man, you gotta, you gotta talk to a second person that isn't, you know, directly related to you sometimes. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, this movie has, I would say, a a uh, a slightly uh, broad uh, villain that that one Whew. could maybe uh, pick a few nits about. Uh, <laughs> I would say that Sam Raimi's entire oeuvre basically right <laughs> uh is it go, goes broad he he's yes uh you know like you know, griff we we saw the gift for example uh-huh uh a movie that that you know is is a very like uh broad portrayal of sort of southern gothic horror i right? was gonna say uh, a lot of his, the characters in that one take on all of the south is very similar <laughs> uh, i'm trying to think of other sam raimi movies that are not just set in a cabin mostly his movies are set in cabins i, that, I guess that's how he kind of <laughs> right um have not seen oz the great and powerful Long, it, it recently enough to remember how that movie treats Oz, Oz people from Oz, though. It, it's I, more I an, yeah. anti-witch. It's strongly anti-witch. Um, well, sure, right, right, yeah. Um, it is funny that this movie has the joke of Justin Long saying, "Like, look, I know it's been a rough couple of weeks. Let's go up to the cabin. <laughs> let's take it easy." Like the worst thing anyone can offer in the Sam Raimi movie is like, "Let's just take a weekend alone in the cabin." <laughs> um. But the the in his career, this is such like you say, Griffin. Yeah. What what what's a good analog for this? Like, how many other directors have sort of hopped off of whatever the franchise train, been like, I'm going to go back. Like like it'd be like George Lucas, you know, or whoever being like, you know, actually going, you know, paying off the promise of like, I'm going to make a movie for me. You you'll you'll see, you'll all see. Except he, you know, he's never done it. Like, and Raimi actually sort of makes a small little horror movie that's evocative of his early career, puts it out, and then never did it again. Like, that's the weird thing. Like, you you, you watch this and you're sort of like, oh, he must have a bunch of these scripts, like, bet rattling around in his drawer. I, I have some potential insights into that, but I, I'll say sure. also, like, I think an interesting counterpoint to this movie is that the exact same year is The Lovely Bones, which is, in sure. theory... Mm -hmm. Peter Jackson trying to do a similar thing, being like, can I go back and make Heavenly Creatures now? I've done my Lord of the Rings right. trilogy. I've done King Kong. Can I find my my small good book and do an mm. actor driven story? And somehow Lovely Bones cost a hundred million dollars. Is it didn't riddled cost with CGI. It didn't cost a hundred million, but it did. It, it, it's, it cost way grounds? too much money. <laughs> well, <laughs> remember, there's a whole thing with the boat in the bottle, and like she because there's oh, all that yeah. stuff where she's in. Uh, the purgatory or the spirit world or what right like there's all that right. stuff that, sure. that, that like he yeah anyway uh, the in-between 
Plus, Saoirse Ronan's rate was uh, yes. was seventy million dollars. Of Is course, that she had an movie? Oscar nomination. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, but that was like uh, uh, Lynn Bramsey was supposed to make that movie for like fifteen million dollars, yep. and she had the rights. And then Peter Jackson like swung around and was like, "Please!" And Alice Seabold <laughs> was just like, "Deal broken, ripped up contract, handed it to Peter Jackson." And Peter Jackson was like, "We spent like a year with Weta trying to design the in between." And you're like, it's so overblown. It's so overthought. It looks like a fucking Lisa Frank folder. And Lynn Ramsey, when it came out, was like, yeah, I don't know. I would have like shot her in the woods or something. I wouldn't have made some fucking. That's not the point. You're so caught up on the wrong details here. And like, it was so astounding that Raimi could actually go back and make a movie of this size. And it didn't feel like he was overburdening it and it also didn't feel like he was i think sometimes when people try to do this like make the film like they used to make in the earlier part of their career it sometimes feels like they're tying an arm behind their back and they're like oh i'm like trying to make a movie i made when i was younger and dumber and trying to forget everything they've learned in the in between whereas i think he's he's bringing everything to the table here in the in between of their career or in the in between of peter jackson's the lovely bones both both <laughs> okay. both okay. Just checking. <laughs> well speaking of peter jackson let me give you some context about the uh, drag me to hell griffin mm -hmm. um post spider-man 3 obviously mm -hmm. is is when this mm -hmm. movie is coming together uh first he wants to make an adaptation of the We Free Men, the Terry Pratchett Discworld book, uh -huh. uh, oh. which is like one of Discworld is one of those sort of you know massive niche, uh, you know uh, fan. I, I love the Discworld books, or I loved them when I was a kid. You know, like that, that's never really been done uh, by Hollywood. I don't know if like I think the Terry Pratchett estate is fairly guarded about it, or it, it falls apart because they Terry Pratchett hated the script, mm -hmm. so that doesn't happen. <laughs> And then speaking of Peter Jackson, Raimi wants to do The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. He's he he put his name in for that. Like when Jackson leaves The Hobbit and then they hire Guillermo del Toro instead. It was pretty much between the two of them by all accounts, right? Like it was they were the only two guys seriously in consideration. I mean, mm -hmm. I I don't know what happens if Raimi gets on board. I don't like I I don't know if that thing was doomed no matter what. Or if Raimi would have just been like, sure, I'll I was do my thing. I say, what is, are we pro Raimi Hobbit? I can't even, I'm having trouble uh, picturing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not really, I got to be honest. Yeah. I'm very pro Del Toro Hobbit. And I wish Absolutely. it had happened as one movie. And I wish, and when you see the first Hobbit, right, that it resulted, the Del Toro stuff in it is fun. The weird little creatures he had designed mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. like, you're like, oh, that's cool. Like, this would have been good. But yeah, anyway, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a happen. tough question because on one hand, it sort of felt like no one else could make it other than Peter Jackson at that point. But also the mm -hmm. circumstances in which Peter Jackson came back around and ended up making it felt a little bit dispiriting. Right. Everything mm -hmm. about The Hobbit is dispiriting. Those movies are funny, though, and I do kind of stick up for them, but they are also bad. Like, I would love to see a Sam Raimi Hobbit movie in a universe where the Hobbit rights were held by someone different and they could be entirely its own thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like if, if Sam Raimi just had the ability to adapt The Hobbit, I think that's actually well suited to him as a book. I think having to tie it into what Jackson's pre-established is maybe like a little impossible. That's fair. Yeah. Bring, bring. Uh, phone's ringing, Griffin. I'm going to pick it up. Click. Hello. Yeah, there's a buzzing in my ear. Is someone sleeping or is it a big bug? That's what I can't tell. David, do you not recognize? No. This new blockbuster ad read character? Who is it? It's the cineast bee. The cineast bee? Is this related to the cineast cow? Moby. Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Uh, hello, cineast B. Do you, much like the cineast cow, not really say anything except for, you know, uh, a noise? Moby. Okay. You're forgetting, David, that the cineast cow at one point, it was uh, revealed, could uh, speak the king's English. And then it kind of felt like the character jumped the shark. So maybe we need a new Moby spokesperson who only has, uh, speaks by Pokemon rules. Right. 
just sort of says one word over movie. and over again, their name. Well, Movie is a curated streaming service that shows exceptional films from around the globe, and every day they premiere a new film. Mm. They could be from iconic directors or emerging auteurs, always something new to discover, and each and every one is hand-selected. So it's your own personal film festival, streaming anywhere, anytime. Movie. We love movie. Longtime fans of movie. I am looking at movie right now. Griff, you looking at movie? I was going to say, yeah, this is our favorite part of being able to do movie ad reads. As you pull up the old homepage, you look what's on there. So they just added Spa Night by Andrew Ahn. Now, Andrew Ahn, of course, directed Fire Island, which is you know, sure. a new movie. Spa Night was his debut, and that was where my little you know antenna went up. I was like, who's this? Yeah. This is interesting. Uh, so that's a movie I would really recommend. Your little B antenna. Yes. No, I, that's the thing I love about movie is very often they will curate based on things going on in the current film world. Like, for example, they got the last two Ruben Oslin movies, Force Majeure and Square, because he recently became a double palm winner, a thing you and I have very strong feelings about. We do. Um, we do have that. But yeah, no, obviously both worth seeing. Oh, look, Mud. You love Mud. Jeff Nichols is Mud, right? That's a, you're a fan of that one. I love Mud. I think that movie fucking rules. Uh, Here's the thing. David. Yeah. Are you seeing this? I'm scrolling down. Being Green, Jim Henson's early shorts. Oh, very interesting. Now, three of these are animated. Four, excuse me. But it also has uh, four live action shorts. This is like pre-Muppets, including Timepiece, which I believe got nominated for an Academy Award. They're really, really interesting, entirely experimental short films. Those are hard to see. Yeah, sure. Well, movie often has stuff that you might not find anywhere else. Um, and you can try movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash check. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash check for a whole month of great cinema for free. That's it. Movie.com slash check. That's it. Movie. So this is a script he wrote with his brother in the 80s. Mm-hmm. It's, it was called The Curse. So it had literally been like just in his drawer, basically, Griffin. Like mm-hmm. he he and and it's what we said. It's just he gets he gets together with Rob Tapert, the guy, his producing partner who's been running Ghost House Pictures and making those, you know, horror movies. What did they have, Griffin? Let's see. The Grudge remake. That was the big Boogie one. Man? Oh, Boogie yeah. Man? What was Boogie Man? I mean, this was the thing. All of these movies would come out in January, open to $20 million, quietly make $50 million, and then disappear right. into the ether. Barry Boogie Man, Watson. Yes. Uh, okay. The Messengers with uh, Kristen Stewart, 30 Days of Night. Uh, sure, that's Hartnet, right? Uh, 30 right. Days of Night was Hartnet, yeah. I don't remember the messenger. That was ooh the the Pang brothers. The Pang brothers. Remember them? Right. It's a Oxide it's a, and Danny Pang. It's a Kristen Stewart like farmhouse movie. Hmm. Yeah, a sunflower farm in North Dakota is invaded uh, by ominous darkness. I'm in. Uh, so, yeah, it sounds pretty good. Uh, so uh, apparently he's inspired by and the, oh no 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 I'm sorry. It's that there was a trend piece written in the LA Times that tied together him, Sam Mendes making Away We Go, mm. Steven Soderbergh making The Girlfriend Experience, and Ang Lee making Taking Woodstock, which is basically like all these guys are trying to to shrink it down. Like all these all these big shots are are trying to go small again. I don't know. I don't know that's, if that's a trend. Those movies no. are all very different. Yeah, I was gonna say those are very different films. Uh, <laughs> the thing I do know, I don't know if if JJ pulled this up in his research, but that. Raimi, after seeing uh, Shaun of the Dead, handed the script to Edgar Wright and was like, you should make this. You're like a young me. And Edgar Wright was like, if I made this, it would be karaoke. (laughs) Interesting. Like, I could do an impression of you and make this movie, but what's the point? Like, you should make this. I think that was Mm -hmm. kind of the thing was that he pulled this script out of the drawer and said, like, maybe it's time to find a younger filmmaker to make this and I'll produce it. And I think Edgar Wright saying that to him was the thing that made him question, like, could I go back and make a smaller movie again? Uh, apparently, Edgar Wright says he later visited the set of Drag Me to Hell during shooting. Sam Raimi was shooting in the graveyard. He was wearing his suit, as he famously always wears a suit uh, on set, and was covered in mud and saw Edgar Wright and shouted, this is all your fault at him. Yeah. So that's funny. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um. Yeah, I did not uh, know that he wore a suit uh, on set. This is news to me. Fucking day. 
Yes. That he, he has this is whole, fascinating. I'm a professional doing my job. I should, right? That's his thing, right, Griff? Right. There, there's something very, like, uh, squeaky clean and, like, straight arrow about Sam Raimi where he's like, well, I make pictures for a living and I take the job very seriously. And so I wear a suit to show respect to the cinematic arts. Right. I was going to say that's very like grew up in Michigan of him. Yes. Uh, right. That's like, it's like, I am at work and this is, this is my suit. Yeah. <laughs> was he wearing a suit? Wait, is, was he wearing a suit when he was directing the evil dead when he was like 12? I like, I, I we, he was, was 12 years old, of course. When, yeah. Yeah. They called him the yeah. wonder boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think he was, I do think that is his class. I mean, maybe not for like, the, the 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 early the first Evil Dead like I, you know there you see pictures of him in like a button down or whatever David David okay. in what, what's our uh, Quick and the Dead episode Roman Mars our yep. guest was asking about the timeline of when Raimi starts wearing the suit so JJ our oh that's right uh, that's dug right. in and he sent us a thread okay so he said he showed us a picture <laughs> from Evil Dead two where he's wearing shirt and tie but like short sleeve white button down shirt with Ty. Like, he looks like uh, Michael Douglas in Falling Down, right? <laughs> and then by Dark Man, long sleeves Ty. By Army of Darkness, jacket. But it's not a proper suit. So he keeps it's upgrading. Like red jacket, shirt, right. tie, he's, slacks. He's inching. Right, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. I mean, the man knows how to build cannon over time. Good for him. Yes. And then <laughs> oh, yeah. I I think it's somewhere around Quick or Dead and uh, Simple Plan where it's it's a proper suit. It is a grown-up's suit. Oh, I don't know what I thought would happen. If, when you Google Sam Raimi suit, it's a million pictures of the Spider-Man suit. Oh, I don't well, know what I thought I would happen. Sure, sure. That's, <laughs> that's rude, actually, you. though. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, the only other thing he says about developing this, apart from the fact that he, yes, he just tried to get someone else to make it, mm-hmm. I guess because he couldn't trust that he couldn't make a small movie, was that he, he uh, you know, wrote it with Ivan a zillion years ago. It's all made up, obviously. It's this all movie's total not nonsense. based on True Story? No, no, but I mean, like, it's not based on anything. It's not like some piece of myth. Or, it's you not know, like, based on lore, right? right. Sure, sure. Right. He was just like, we just wanted a movie about a character who commits the sin of greed and has to pay a price for it. It's in every mythology or whatever, right? Like, he's just like, it's like we were trying to be as simple as possible. He calls it, I want to find uh, serving up spaghetti in meatballs, but pretending it's a full course meal. That is, he, sure. he just wanted it to be as dumb and stupid as possible is his apparently marty noxon uh who people probably know best from buffy vampire slayer and other tv shows uh rewrote the script and then they decided not to use her rewrite because it was like sm- smarter is is the way he puts it we, we like the direct <laughs> dumb stupid version is, is what he says she wrote a movie that you and i uh defend a lot the fright night remake which which is an example of like this movie's a lot smarter than it needs to be Y'all seen the Fright mm-hmm. Night remake with uh, with uh, Colin Farrell? Hot Colin and Farrell. Anton Yelkin? I feel, oh, yes, I have, but I don't remember it very well. Do you like Colin Farrell's arms? Yes. <laughs> then sure. I recommend yeah. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. With, uh, with a lot the, of if emphasis. If that's the bar for entry, I'm in, yeah. baby. I'm just saying, like, there are other things to recommend about that movie. It's got poots. It's mm. got sexy David Tennant. Really good with, David Tennant. Like, yeah. eyeshadow. Mm. He plays, like, you know. Chris Angel mind freak, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> right. Huh. Right. But, I mean, like, oh, if... So good. If I was like on the street trying to get someone to come to a preview of this movie with like yeah. a clipboard, I'd be like, "Hey, do you like Colin Farrell's arms? Anybody? Anyone like Colin Farrell's arms specifically?" Give a full theater in two minutes. Exactly. I got a movie that's about eighty minutes of that, and then twenty minutes of plot. So <laughs> I, if you're I'd even interested. right. If I could unpack that further, I would say obviously the arc of Colin Farrell's career is he was like they tried to sell him to us as like this is the hottest guy in the world right and it never fully connected with the audience and then he sort of refound himself as a character actor and fright night is the one movie where he figures out how to make being hot part of his character acting like it's like weaponized <laughs> hottness in modern right. character it's a actor special Colin skill Farrell. it's a yeah. very special skill he's like traditionally hot in that movie but good oh that's a Craig Gillespie movie. It is Craig Gillespie. Such a weird career, Craig Gillespie. One of the weirdest careers. Yeah. He is very hard to pin down because he also made the, what's it called? 
the finest hours. Is that uh-huh. what it's called, Griffin? Yes, yes. The, the, the Chris Pine, you know, he's got a the, the boat movie where he's in the boat. Man on a boat. Ben yes, Foster, yeah. Eric Bana, yeah. Casey Affleck. Where it's like, well, how does this guy pick his projects? Right. It's so funny. <laughs> Cruella, Mr. Woodcock. He did do Mr. Woodcock. Right. That's right. Then there's the I, Tanya, Pam, and Tommy lane, which seems to be what he's doubling down on now. Sure. Right, right. Yeah. Like some biopicy stuff. But, but then the finest hours. I've probably shut it out before. Chris Pine going like, we got to get over the bar. We got to go rescue that boat. <laughs> all get that. that. It's so good. Yeah. Um, all right. So this movie got a $30 million budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Elliot Page was going to be the star. And I remember that. I remember the casting announcement. Uh, mm-hmm. And I guess, I think it was a SAG strike problem. Or there was some scheduling reason. Uh, and Allison Lohman like or replaces him like you know it was i don't know there was mm-hmm. whatever it was not like some dramatic thing what do you guys think of allison loman we have to have the allison loman I mean, conversation. this is for all intents and purposes her last movie she marries yes. brian nevildeen or is it I mark nevildeen mark? Mark i get i'm confused nevildeen taylor who did crank and ghost rider spirit of vengeance and all those mm-hmm. wacky movies she marries one of those guys the year this movie comes out and since then, she has had three on-screen appearances that are all cameos in movies that he directed or produced. This is Do you her know why l- that is? She was like, I got married, I had kids, I, w- I didn't want to act anymore. Uh, oh, okay. Well, we, well, I'll say she's got a, she's got a slightly mm. problematic Twitter feed. I don't want to be rude about Alison Lohman, and people can do whatever they want to do or whatever. But when I look at her Twitter feed, I'm like, this is a lot of tweets about crypto and Elon Musk. Oh, it's huh. like, wait, for my Ooh. liking. Hmm. Um, but uh, but 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 that aside, do you guys have Alison Lohman takes? There was a you know, there's sort of a six year Alison Lohman moment, I guess. Starting with like White Oleander coming to this, right? You got like Big Fish, Matchstick Men, uh, Flicka. Yeah. Flicka, I was a, you know, look, I was a Flicka head at the time. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I liked You got flicked. I, I got, I got, I, I caught the flick and uh, I love a horse girl with some horse hair, horsing around. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I have a really strong take on her. I was like, she's fine. I don't know. She like in my head she could she could have been a bunch of people knowing that Elliot Page might have done the part you're like yeah that would have probably been a better performance but I, I, I agree I mean, I but I think she's good at, at you know being upset and screaming and, and I, I I you know and there is something to the performance you you do buy that she whatever kind of might sell her soul to be a middle manager at Citibank yeah, or whatever I, like right like yeah, that's sort yeah, of the sure. crucial thing right you need to you need to you can't just be like oh this is a wide-eyed innocent you know you need you need a little bit of that uh to to go yes. with it I loved Alice Lohman in this I I think it's a pretty great performance I, I think if anything it's like perfectly deployed her whole thing in this period and it is truly like a seven-year career where she was everywhere it was just like she was like unbelievably gentle right like everything about her like she looks like an ann getty's like baby portrait and her voice is so like slight and everything about Mm. her just felt so kind of fragile and so there was a lot of her playing like deeply emotionally wounded people or playing kind of like saintly impossibly perfect love interests you know and things like that and then this is like his best friend or flick his best friend i'm sorry that's the other thing she would get typecast (laughs) sometimes as is uh yeah flick his best friend (laughs) specifically flick his best friend yeah Yeah. right Mm -hmm. i i remember the ellie page thing being really interesting at the time because that that sort of position that an actor can get into like post oscar nomination where it's like well you haven't won but you had, especially like for Paige where Juno was such a big hit on top of it, but like your profile has grown so significantly. And now there's mm-hmm. this question of like, are you a movie star? Are you like a leading star? Uh, what do we do with you? And Paige, I think especially post Juno had like such a specific persona in people's minds. I think there was the mm-hmm. assumption of just like, you can make like three more comedies like that. You can be the like acerbic, fast talking, quippy person, uh, which seemed to not be of interest. I I have to imagine just in terms of timing that Inception is the thing that takes Paige out of the running. Mm-hmm. For it probably. This. 
Right. A different movie with uh, Dilip Rao. Dilip Rao, who right. had one of the most incredible 18-month run. runs for an actor who also seemingly, like, disappeared. Huh. Yeah. He's, well, James he's, Cameron I believe he's in Avatar right? too. He's, yeah, he's yeah. in both of the... I think that James kid, uh, James kidnapped... James Cameron kidnapped him. <laughs> I think so, because he's in yeah. I, maybe all four of the Avatar sequels. Well, but I think we only know that he's in the first two, but the next two are real mysteries. But sure. yes, he is, he's been down there filming with, every, with Joel David Moore, who tried to mark it correct, Justin Long, of course, himself. <laughs> right. I hope, uh, I hope uh, for his sake it's worth it. That's a, that's a long time. It does see. It does seem tiring. Yeah, he was in one episode of Mr. Robot. That's the thing. It's wow. like right. Drag me to hell. Avatar: Inception. All in eighteen months, and then it's like one wow. episode of Mr. Robot, one episode of Children's Hospital, two episodes of Touch, one episode of Z Nation, a lot of short films, mm. and three movies yeah. I've never heard of. Remember Amnesia? Kind of an oxymoron. Extracurricular <laughs> activities and Biba Boys. I'm looking at his Twitter feed. He hates Elon Musk. Good. Just I'm just I'm just gonna tell you what everyone seems to think Please. of Elon Musk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, he's and he's retweeting a lot of Avatar stuff. So I guess uh, yeah, he's excited for that. I don't know. Thank God. Uh, um, he was dump, dunking on Scott Walker the other day. He tweets a lot. Just tweet less, Dilip. Come on, come I, on. Let's let, more movies, less tweeting. I think <laughs> as much as I am an Elliot Page fan and yeah. probably prefer Paige as an actor in general to Loman. I do think Paige might have been like a little bit too hard edge for this movie where I think the main game Raimi's playing with this film is like, this is someone who is so sure that she is a good person, you know? Mm. Like there's mm. something about yeah. how innocent Allison Lohman reads where when she starts to get like angry and bitter stuff, it feels more subversive. But also that like her being cursed feels more um, subversive, if that makes sense, you know? Like yeah. especially coming right off of Juno, you're just gonna be like, well, like, but Paige is always gonna be the smartest person in the room, you know? Right. I think, I mean, Allison's performance was a little hit or miss for me. And in some scenes I was like, wow, she's doing a pretty good job at this acting thing. And other times I'm like, I don't think she's doing a very good job, but I also think that might just be leaning into like the Sam Raimi-ness of it all. I would so, grant her I that. Know, I kept, yeah. yeah, I think I think that was it f for a lot of it for me. But yeah, I mean, I I bought that she was on the precipice of being dragged to hell. So I believed yeah. that. The nosebleed, her nosebleed performance. Uh, oh, wow. You can't take that from her. Not just a nosebleed. She's also gushing out of her mouth. She's bleeding out Everywhere. of her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it was a full face bleed. <laughs> it, it is a full face bleed. David Paymer really kills that scene. Um, th there's a thing on the, on the Blu-ray, the Shout Factory, Scream Factory release that I guess was a couple years ago where they did like a sit-down interview with her, which is just kind of like rare because she's pretty much stayed out of the public eye other than tweeting pro uh, Elon Musk, Johnny Depp stuff for the last uh, 10 years. <laughs> um, and uh, she said that like th this, uh, despite the fact that this was a script that he had had for several decades, that it was like pretty much always in flux and Raimi was very improvisational with it. And she'd show up on the day and he'd be like, today we're going to pour bugs in your mouth. <laughs> and she'd be like, oh, oh, okay, when, when does that happen? He's like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Like, there was a lot of, I think, her just being told, like, we're going to do this thing now, and you just have to react. And she's like, or I could just retire, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, right. it does seem like it was a very intense filming process. Raimi was very much like, I really tried to warn her, you know, that it was going to be very physical and very insane, right? You know, so he's like, I threw her out of a car. I threw fake candy glass at her, whipped her around the room in a harness. I buried her alive. Like, you know, like he's, he, he clearly feels maybe not guilty, but he's just like, I hope she knew what she was in for when she like read this script or whatever. I mean, I personally would not do this movie. I would say no. I might play David Paymer. I would take that role. You take you the can, you can, role. You can hey, gush blood take a on blood me gush to the face. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And then I go, like, I was, Is it get on me. I was stop fascinated. It, he says. By, <laughs> stop bleeding on me. He's like, stop it. Anyway, sorry, James. I was fascinated by the story of uh, Lorna Raver getting cast as, as Mrs. Ganush, where the anecdote that I read was 
Um, so she's like the the main antagonist, and that she only auditioned thinking she was a little old lady coming into the bank because yes. they're foreclosing on her house, and they didn't oh. tell her what character she was playing. Yeah, I was like that. <laughs> I feel like she should have known. I don't know. Yeah. She had two film credits uh, in her <laughs> career. Uh, she was a big New York and Chicago theater actor, I guess. Right. Uh, and that, so that was mostly her background. But yes, she says she had no idea. Get, which I guess they didn't give her the whole script for the audition. And then mm-hmm. when then they were like, here's the whole script, by the way. And she said, quote, oh, my. <laughs> That's the end of the quote. But it's also funny, uh, like, even if you don't give someone the full script, uh, usually, like, if someone's going to, say, turn into a deadite for most of the running time, <laughs> you have them do one scene where they walk into the bar, uh, bank and ask for a loan, and you have them do a second scene where they, like, scream and uh, puke eyeballs on you. To, to not even in the audition be given any indication that that's a whole other part of the character you're gonna have to play until you're hired is uh i don't know Remy had a lot of trust in her i guess yeah i'm like maybe he saw her perform before like i don't know i mean she she plays the hell out of the part like regardless of what you think of the part she did she does a great job but it's like yeah Yeah. that was i was like they didn't give her the full premise (laughs) before they hired her (laughs) I, I, I yeah I don't know I mean you know Raver says like look they were great stunt coordinators and the doubles showed Allison and I exactly what to do without hurting each other, uh, but mm-hmm. uh, she does she does essentially say like it it was a completely unexpected insane thing to to do all this stuff like and <laughs> to have all this crazy makeup on and mm. blah you know blah, 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 blah. to get your head crushed by an anvil mm-hmm. which i'm assuming was a completely practical effect yeah that was practical they actually did do <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. there was no stunt no stunt double or anything you gotta Sam, tell an actor Sam Raimi was, an just, was just head. on a ladder he's like all right stand there <laughs> um yeah i mean it, 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 the way Raimi talks about it is it was just like a joy i think he loved making this movie mm-hmm. uh griffin yeah. you, are you reading these quotes the most fun i've had in 20 years making a picture uh hired all the best technicians i i guess it's the, it's the 30 million dollar budget thing where it's like he's making the evil dead again except he has but comparatively a massive budget so he can just you know have every expert on hand and it's still a quote unquote cheap movie by and his he has complete now. creative control i think probably the assumption was because he made the three spider-man movies back to back he didn't even do the thing that a lot of these guys do where like in between each movie you do a palate cleanser you know yeah. like nolan does prestige and inception in between batman movies mm-hmm. or the guys who are like let me make a smaller thing you know taika watiti is going to do a jojo rabbit in between thor's or whatever Ever, that he did three of them back to back they all were so huge even if you know three was unpopular it was the highest grossing movie of that year and it's like okay either he's gonna make like a fucking disc world he's gonna launch a new franchise he's gonna make some huge new vfx thing or the other assumption would probably be he's gonna try to make like another prestige movie he's gonna go back to simple plan land and like try to win an oscar now to be like i just want to do a 35 million dollar horror movie uh, especially when it's greenlit with someone who is like recently minted as an Oscar nominated star, uh, even though they replace Paige with someone who like is a lot less famous. I think it was still like you just you got it set up fine. You produced a bunch of these just fucking do whatever the hell you want. You know, like no one was messing with him at all. I heard a story that uh, I cannot cite my source on this, but that the budget is on this movie was higher than it was reported. But it was because Raimi started putting his own money into trying to, like, pump up the effects. Oh, that's cool. That he just, like, r- really was all in on this thing. I mean, um, the effects are the, – the effects in the seance scene are so wild. Like, there's – The goat? Yeah. <laughs> the goat? I was like, I mm, forgot the there's so many uh, solid canonical movie goats. Okay. So who we got? Black Phillip, obviously. No, yeah, Black really Phillip. You've got this. You've got the ghost, the goat in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. That was a oh. personal goat fave of mine as a child. It went. <laughs> <laughs> What's it? His name's like Jolly. <laughs> his name's Jolly, and yeah. his only line is. <laughs> 
Um, what about the goats that the men stared at and the men who stare at goats, which I never saw? Yeah. But it's in the Sears. title. Yeah. Do goats appear in that movie? I haven't seen it. I have seen it. <laughs> There's goats? I don't remember. The men stare <laughs> no. at them. Yeah. Yeah. Men do stare at them. Uh, th- what Good. about like every uh, Jeff Bridges performance since 2008? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, Just shows goat is, up with a scraggle do, beard, ch- chews I on a can. Do feel like, I feel like I'm forgetting a goat. I feel like there actually is another, yeah, a, another a demonic goat, goat that I'm forgetting. Yes. Uh, it, movie it may, goats. Yeah. Movie goats, goats in movies. Let's see. It doesn't help that there's that movie called Goat, but it's about like frat bullying. That's not helpful. <sighs> right. I'm seeing a movie here oh, called yes. Goats, which does have a goat on a poster. Uh, there's the goat that they feed a dinosaur in Jurassic Park. I was Park. about to say, that's a big okay, one. Okay, yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I guess Pan from Pan's Labyrinth is sort of goaty. He's he's a it's, he's like a fawn, right? He's, goat, he's goat-like. Yeah. Yeah, he's got goat legs. Yeah, you got a lot of goat know. adjacent characters. Sure, that's true. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm on um, hypeable.com slash goats. I think on we film were TV. all three looking at the exact <laughs> we, same <laughs> list. That's what I was looking at. I got I gotta cite my sources because I use the best sources. Scholarly journal. Uh, what is it called? <laughs> hypeable.com. Hypeable.com. There, there's. I love how these articles are written. It's my favorite. They, even Harry Potter can't resist a great goat. They're <laughs> like, what are you talking about? The Goat Tribune. There was apparently Aberforth Dumbledore has a real fondness for goats. Well, that's sure. Right. Of course. Dumbledore's brother sure. likes goats. Yes. I forgot about that. I don't There's know if they weave that I into know. the films, though. Right. They, 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 they may have cut that out of the movies. There's the goat in the big um, green, right? I'm not getting it wrong. That's the animal. I think they have a goat. Never in seen movie. the big green. Well, I talk about it a lot. It's kind of rude you at do. this point because we've been doing this podcast together for almost eight that's years. That's the soccer movie, right? That's yeah. The, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. It was a pretty, uh, big, never... pretty big, important film. Drag Me to Hell is in my, in my top three goats i wow. would say just under black philip mm-hmm. same yeah. right I, um yeah uh, the goat required six puppeteers fyi just telling well, you see this is what Worth i find impressive penny. though like it's a puppeteered goat where they clearly are doing some babe style cgi lip replacement so they're able right. to get mm-hmm. like a better mouth movement than you would out of just an animatronic and this whole movie i feel like he is doing a very good job of combining practical and digital stuff we were having this conversation david on our text thread with the Doughboys, and mike mitchell is like a big horror movie fan and who tends to dislike cgi and he was saying like what's the scariest movie that uses a lot of cgi like mm-hmm. making the argument that most horror films when they're it, it gets too digital it starts to lose some sort of like tactility and it becomes less scary and i think this is a movie where it's like clear that he built a lot of shit and did a lot sure. of shit for real on camera and then uses the cgi to like just amp it up in a really good way and it all makes it feel kind of uh uh hallucinogenic yeah i i don't mind the cgi in this you know you guys go ahead because yeah, uh, I think I think there's I think there's a counter argument. There's some questionable okay. with CGI moments. Most notably for me, the one where the anvil. Okay, so the anvil seems pretty real. That's Keep a practical back to anvil. The anvil. Yeah, I love the, the Roger Rabbit anvil. And then the anvil falls on the head, and then we get the eyeballs <laughs> popping out, and then the splatter of like the eyeballs and face goo yes. blood guts that go yes. into Christine's face is like some of the worst CGI I've ever seen in my life. But this is what I like about it is that I think n- he he is incredibly disinterested in any of this looking realistic. It's more sure. just like mm-hmm. the weird feeling of like waking up from a dream and being like, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, th- you know, when you're trying to describe a nightmare to somebody and you're like, it's like she like puked blood onto me, but it didn't look like blood. It looked like chocolate pudding. <laughs> like yeah, everything she... has that odd otherworldly quality where you're just like this do- this doesn't look right like the texture of this isn't correct yeah i kind of i sort of maybe i'm like wrong but i assumed when the when the cgi didn't look amazing it was like supposed to look kind of weird it didn't bother me i liked the the combination of like practical and cgi with like the full the full awuga eyeball i was like i i loved every single part of it 
I, I, right. I'm pro any of that just because it seems within the tone of the film. It, it, there's a world where this movie's yeah. trying to be more serious, right. and then that that's where your brain breaks because you're like, well, wait a second, this is obviously fake, or right. whatever. Mm-hmm. And instead, with this, it, it, especially because anytime something like that happens, then it goes away really quickly. And everyone's just supposed to be like, huh? like, right, like every, every you, he wants the audience to then do the sort of the yelp, the scream, the laugh, and then the sort of excited chatter, right, like that, that little, that little, the you know, eyeball on the cake, like appearing yeah. and reappearing and disappearing, a lot and of eyeballs, yeah, a lot, lot of eyeballs. Lot of eyeballs. Yeah. I mean, it was, it is the kind of genius thing of him making a PG thirteen horror movie where it's like fairly light on blood and gore you know in quotes but like has snot and worms and eyeballs and like all kinds of gross stuff where you're like gooey movie right where you're like well i guess this isn't violent in the way i would you know like i would associate with a horror movie like you know like it feels like he's pulling a little trick like on the mpaa in that way there's not a lot of blood but there is a lot of gross but there is a scene where she right she like throws up embalming fluid question yes. mark all over him her yeah that, that's it right? I was like is that that's what that's that was supposed it. to be the, oh, the, that, that, scene, that is brutal that scene is really funny because it almost plays like someone you know like knocking over a bunch of glasses at a party or something that are filled with champagne where she like yes. it, the, the the fluid keeps coming out and she used to be like ah, i'm sorry i'm sorry you know like it's it's <laughs> It's almost just like comedy of manners shit. It's for a Peter second. Parker trying to get the brooms back in the closet. It's just like this thing he loves of just letting everything go on for a little bit too long. Like he, there is so much yeah. fucking of the rhythms of like when something crazy happens in this movie and then it ends so abruptly versus the time where it's like how how can this still be happening fifteen seconds later? I, it is interesting because right. I mean I think this movie was seen as something of uh, an underperformer at the box office. And I was reading like articles from the time where they were like, why didn't this thing do at least as well as like the boogeyman? Like that was the, you know, they were saying like Sam Raimi has been releasing these movies in January and February that are mediocre. And this one's so much better. Why isn't it outgrossing those? Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how it sort of played against this movie that it was PG-13 because it was clearly esoteric enough that it wasn't going to be sold to like teenagers as here's your normal scary movie. Like it looked weirder than that. But to appeal to the more hardcore horror audience, they wanted to see like super extreme viscera blood and guts, which him doing a PG-13 movie to some people read as like, Oh, is this a compromise? So I watched, which I hadn't watched before, the unrated cut of this movie that's yeah, on too. the Ooh. disc. It is truly yeah. a difference of 10 seconds. Right. It's six seconds of difference between the two. Yeah. What's yeah. the difference? The only scene uh, that is different, uh, like wholesale, and it's really a scene fragment, is her killing the cat is done differently. Oh, uh, okay. It's like a close up with her stabbing off camera, but the blood spatters onto her face. Oh, I saw that cut then too. Yeah. Okay. And then outside I of that, it. it's that's a good moment, but it's like outside of that, it's literally like an extra frame here, an extra shot there. When she does the CGI puke of the eyeballs and the goo, it's more red. It, whereas in the theatrical, it's more brown. Like it's like tiny, tiny differences like that. Okay. I didn't, I didn't bother. Me. I mean, I'm not like a huge horror like i i enjoy horror movies i don't know the like when it gets too granular i get lost but like i didn't mind this as a pg-13 movie at all like yeah no and i think watching the cut the unrated cut makes it clear that it was like always designed as a pg-13 movie it's not like he had to make any serious compromises and water down his vision and Mm. He gets a lot in there. Like, we we watched the Evil Dead remake for Patreon, which the whole marketing campaign on that movie was like, you're not going to fucking believe how bloody this fucking thing is. It's right at all. <laughs> like, all the posters and taglines are like, it's fucking bloody. And I feel like this movie is more upsetting on a sort of, like, goo and viscera level than that film is, despite just yeah. using different colors 
and like non blood substances and sound effects. This movie gets such good fucking the use. Sound yeah. design. The yeah. fucking yeah. like jello budget the Foley artist must have been given on this film. <laughs> There's a moment where, she, where uh, Mrs. Ganish like just squeezes the yes! handkerchief that yes! she has like Ugh. snotted into and it's like so squishy. It was like the grossest part of the movie for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also, yeah, I'm more gross. I, I don't want worms on my face. I'm not afraid of Evil Dead happening to me. That's not going to happen to me. I'm not, I'm not, that's no. not, right. that's not going to happen. I don't know, worms seen, on my face. I've seen Evil Dead so much at that point, especially by 2009. It's like, no. right. he, yeah, we, we know what that is. You've seen it happen. Yeah. But face worms, that's new. Right, there's stuff in this movie that's genuinely new. Like, I mean, we talk about the anvil, but leading up to that, the fist in the mouth, the amount uh-huh. of weird, like, shoving something into someone's mouth or something getting projected out of someone's mouth in this movie just feels like kind of new territory to play with in a lot of ways. I have not seen a person's eyeball get stapled shut. I have not yes, seen a, that a ruler the, be oh. used to stab the someone ruler. in the back of the throat. How how does she not die by the end of that scene? Uh, but instead she has the strength to pick up a cinder block and throw it through the window of a car. Oh, she's she's good. fueled by rage. She's fueled by I rage. I mean, that's yeah. true. Um, yeah. I lost everything to Madoff! And then she's just throwing the cinder block. David? Yeah. I, I, I don't mean to put you on blast on Maine. Okay. Well, you don't have to. But I, I've sensed recently that something's a little wrong with you. Okay. What do you think's the matter? I don't know. It just feels like there's a hole uh, in your soul. That th- there's there's a struggle that you're holding on to very tightly. Mm. Okay. What's that? I've just gotten the sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've become pretty good at reading you over the years of our friendship and work collaboration. I've gotten the sense that you've looked at your business's hiring from every angle, but there's something you feel like you're missing. In your core, David, you know it could be faster. You're right. I need Indeed. Well, I have some good news. You're right. You are correct that you do need Indeed. Because it's the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You don't spend hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills. It's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. And this has been weighing on you so heavily. You've been notably like six inches shorter because you're slouched. It's affecting your home life, your work life, your friends. Look... Yeah, I know, because I'm not using time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, virtual interviews. Nope, none of those. With Instant Match, 80% of employers, over 80%, in fact, get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. That's according to Indeed Data US. That's good timing. The moment is good. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements, right? You know, you're not, you're not just casting a wide net. Indeed's such an unbelievably powerful hiring partner, delivering four times more hires than any other job site. All of them combined, in fact, according to Talent Nest 2019. Yeah, but I bet no businesses worldwide use Indeed. I bet there's just sort of no track record here, David. I'm going to actually tell you that three million businesses worldwide use it. Uh, so there's a huge track record there. Th- 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 three million? Uh, more than, I think. Uh, more than three million. And if you sign up for Indeed now, you will get a $75 credit towards your first sponsored job. Plus, you earn up to $500 extra in sponsored job credits with Indeed's virtual interviews. Visit Indeed.com slash check to learn more. Claim your credits at Indeed.com slash check. Indeed.com slash check. Terms and conditions apply need to hire you need indeed that blows my mind too of like i i do i i don't know much about the any if if at all how much like revising of the script took place but like how perfectly timed it was for a a movie about a lone advisor going to hell like i can't imagine a better time for that to happen except maybe like uh later this year or something right yeah right exactly yeah except in three to four months um but uh, no i think uh uh, it because the film must have when did this shoot like 2008 you know, right I mean that, right but like probably yeah. pre you know Lehman Brothers or whatever you know like and uh so it is funny how it just I remember when it came out people were like oh this is like 
so timely quietly accidentally right. whatever timely and, it just kind of like perfectly met the moment yeah i mean so you know watching all of these and sort of trying to find the the through lines as as we cannot help but do you realize how many of sam raimi's movies are like morality tales in one way or another there's something very square about him in that sense where i think he's really fascinated by these sort of very pure like Someone is faced with a decision and they make one decision and the rest of their life spirals out from that one decision. And in most Sam Raimi movies, it is a decision that curses them for the rest of their lives, right? Like in the supernatural evil dead dragging to hell way or even in the simple plan way where it's like you find the bag of money and you take it rather than leaving it there. That fucks you up for the rest of your life. You never get over that. And Spider-Man is this weird outlier in his career where it's like those are the three movies where the guy has the moment and he makes the right choice. And then the rest of the film is defined by him being like such a moral good, you know, boy scout. Um, mm. But I think he's always sort of fascinated by like that sort of human temptation you know, and these small decisions we can make in like a moment. And there is something I think just about how granular, like, you know, you, you can put on her the sort of, she's someone who's clearly very concerned with seeming like a nice person. I wouldn't throw Hollywood phony yeah. shit at her. Right. But like, even in the scene where she talks about like, I'm a vegetarian, I foster cats. Like she's like right, bragging right. about the things she does that shows that she clearly is a good person, right? And uh, and and has this whole complex about being seen as a, a higher class person and not being seen as the daughter of a drunk, as a farm girl, as all these things, you know, wanting to move up in social strata and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it does boil down to this thing of like, David Paymer is this incredibly banal evil, right? Right. Mm -hmm. This guy who just he's not putting too much mustard on it, very matter of factly says, like, look, when she when people lose their house, we make bank off of that. Right. Like, that's, and huge. that's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's here. What we're here to do. Look, I respect you. You're good at what you do. You're a very nice lady. But like, mm -hmm. you need to be a little more cutthroat in this business. And I leave this decision up to you. Like, I, I love that it is a test that she could. It's not that he says to her, you have to go fucking kick this woman out, right? That he kind of right. sits back in his chair and goes, I don't know. What do you want to do? This is your decision. Right. And she looks but at that fucking empty corner office and <laughs> right. she just makes right. this decision of like, what if I try being an asshole for 10 minutes? What if I just try being an asshole on for size? And it fucking ruins the rest of her life. Right, the the three days she has remaining to live. <laughs> right, it's, until she gets dragged to hell. Yeah, I okay. So this is what really this is part of why I was like this. I don't know what this movie is trying to do or say exactly because, on one hand, you have this character who makes this like capitalist, like corporate complacency choice, and from that moment on. I'm not on her side. I'm not rooting for her. I'm like, I'm on Mrs. Ganesh's side. Like, fuck Christine. She sucks. But then the movie frames her as like any horror movie protagonist generally does as like the character that we're rooting for. Like, oh, no, she's being haunted. She's being tormented by demons. I hope she figures this out and it all stops. But then the movie does end in such a way where you're like, yeah, she got dragged to hell and deservedly so because she admits like i just made this choice out of corporate greed and so that i could get a promotion but like i, I spent the whole movie being like well i'm not rooting for her so i don't care what happens to her i i will say i think it's sort of, sort of like it's got the kind of film noir thing where it's like she makes a mistake where you're like, I don't think she should have done that. But you're also like, yeah, but people make mistakes. And then you're watching the whole movie of her being like, come on, come on. Can I, can I fix this? Like, you know, like, hey, come on, come on. And then right. at the end, it's like, no, crime pays. You're going to hell. That's it. <laughs> right. like, I, I thought I fixed it. I killed a cat. And I'm right, like, it right. is pretty <laughs> harsh. There, the moments that like, I don't know, there, there were like little moments with her where I'm like, ah, there's probably more of me in a moment like that than I would care to admit. Like when she shows up at uh, Mrs. Ganish's house, not knowing that her funeral is actively taking place. Um, <laughs> yep. and, and is like, you know, 
there to apologize, but also gets defensive when she's like, she just like can't really handle being directly called out for anything, mm -hmm. which I think is like a pretty human response to that sort of thing. But when when uh, Mrs. Ganish's granddaughter is like, uh, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, just doesn't buy her story at all. She like, you know, turns to pudding. Um, and then randomly fat shames Christine in a weird I that, that, that was that was one thing where I was like <laughs> Sam like really the Raimi brothers are gonna school us on this all right like well <laughs> there's right there's a lot of readings on this movie that right I doubt Sam Raimi intended that people are like this seems like a movie about a girl with a, a massive eating disorder because right. so much of her mm. like she, discomfort is around eating she refused and and so much of the horror is around like stuff going in her mouth or coming out of her mouth and stuff like that that right. like the cake you scene can, yeah yeah. yeah, like that. That like that. She seems to be almost like seized with like anxiety around, uh, and it, like you see it with obviously her, her, her. Uh, you know the the photo, the swine queen photo, stuff like that, right? right? Like all that stuff. Like so, God knows. I mean, again, it, it's like I feel like if you 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 sit Sam Raimi down, he'd be like, "No, I was just trying to make a stupid movie." Like I, it's not like he's <laughs> ever had any kind of highfalutin take on anything he's ever done. Like every interview with that guy he's like i was just trying to make a movie about a guy who's trying to you know do a thing like you know he's he's very simple about everything but you know i have read takes like that there is that school of filmmaker who avoids any accepting or sort of taking on any reading of their movies as correct right and just goes like i don't know i just made a movie like whatever it is which i sometimes find a little annoying but i also think as a counterpoint, any time a filmmaker comes out with some sort of heady take on what they were trying to say in their movie, it immediately goes viral on Twitter. Is like, get a load of this fucking yeah. clown. Why won't they shut the <laughs> right. fuck up? Don't tell me what your movie is. Let me judge that, right? So it's hard right. to tell with Raimi because I do think first and foremost, he is like an entertainer. I think when we were watching For Love of the Game and uh, The Gift, David, and it's sort of like, why is he making this? Why is his personality getting lost in this? It's because I don't think there's like, he loves to put on a show and he loves to get an emotional reaction out of his audience, right? I think his two favorite things are to like put his lead character in a vice grip and then by proxy put the audience in a vice grip. Like he loves having these characters he can torture and test in some way and making that feel very visceral and very emotional and very heightened so that he's really playing the audience like a like an orchestra or whatever. And I, I think what's interesting about him is excluding spider-man who is this like almost biblical like jesus-like figure of like <laughs> the moral balance right after mm -hmm. he makes his like mistake i i think he like to what you're talking about caitlin of like am i supposed to like this person or not i think that's so much the game he's trying to play with this movie of like mm -hmm. how do i get the audience to react to this how do i constantly shift from scene to scene whether you like this person or this person is Villainous, like Jamie's saying, these scenes where like she comes in and here's Allison Loman and she's so delicate and soft spoken and like looks like a baby, you know, mm -hmm. and is sort of framed as the kind of person who in a movie like this is just oh, what, what, how dare the universe burden them with these awful things. And then she has these moments where the facade breaks and she becomes a little bit unseemly. She lashes out. She shows something petty in her personality. And it sort of like tests in a way that I think if it was someone like Elliot Page, who is more conventionally charismatic, right? You could mm -hmm. sort of like, in a Bruce Campbell way, get into like, oh, it's like fun watching them go bad. When Alison Lohman like lashes out at someone, you're like, this this is weird. She doesn't really like, re she doesn't relish it at all. She's like right. resisting it the entire time. <laughs> yeah, yes. she's like, no, I'm good, I swear. Right, and, and the then, more like, she protests that, the more you're like, I'm questioning it. I really, the, the degree to which you remain so convinced that you are good, and like the cat mm -hmm. scene is such a clear testing of that, you know? And then she gets so upset when she's like, I killed the fucking cat for you. <laughs> Like I did your stupid thing, and what is the she says like keep your cat, you stupid pork queen, or something like that, which is a, a great line, great read of, of that amazing line. piece of cinema. Yeah, bring that yeah. line into more movies. It is. I mean, that does that does 
kind of support the whole like loan officer thing too of just like she has to believe she's a good person to continue showing up making judgments what she does. Yeah. yeah 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 sorry the exact wording was i don't want your cat you dirty pork queen um <laughs> now now to to that Jesus. end and i don't like i think this movie is messy in a lot of ways and you can question a lot of the readings or or how things come off and all of that sort of way i if i could play devil's advocate for half a second I do think some of, like, especially when you look at the first scene of her coming into the bank asking for the loan, right? And as we said, it's like the fucking squishing sound of the handkerchief, mm -hmm. right? And that, like, mm -hmm. she's, like, coughing up green goo even before anything supernatural has happened in the movie. Like, it's so overcranked. And Romani people are obviously, like, so demonized across all of Western fiction, like just mm -hmm. like forever it's been like, well, it's so easy to just make them these creepy, terrifying people in their wagons, right? I do mm -hmm. think this movie is trying to get at something of her, her self-assuredness that she's a good person versus her judgment of everyone around her at all times. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that the way she is, I'm forget what what is the the Lorna Raver character's name? Miss Ganush. The Mrs. way she is, it's spelled, <laughs> excuse me. Mrs. Ganesh. I think the way <laughs> the way Mrs. Ganesh is like depicted to the audience is sort of trying to reflect the way she sees her as like, oh, this is like an uncomfortable gross old woman. Which even I just think there's a through line to like the scene where she goes to Justin Long's parents' house and when she has her like freak out, the thing she does is takes a glass and throws it at the door to the kitchen where mm -hmm. all of their like domestic workers are. You know? Yeah. Right. Shout out to uh, Hecubit the cat, who's right. at that house, <laughs> by the way. I, I yeah. just think there's this like through line, this quiet through line to the movie of her being like, I'm a good person and constantly mm -hmm. trying to maintain her very safe, white, waspy space. Right. She'll be yeah. a good person to a point. I think that would have worked more effectively if she, we saw like her perception of things and like how she perceives mrs ganish versus like how mrs ganish actually is but because we only see one version of mrs ganish which is sure. just like yeah she's got scary fingernails she's like she's coughing weird up eye. goop oh right. yeah like yeah. Right, all these right. things that like d demon like the whole like old women are disgusting and scary trope is like so which is like a very overdone thing in horror movies in general but like this is like fully leaned into, but it, it, that would have worked better for me if, again, like we see Christine's perception of like, oh, I like, yes, I came from this, like I, I grew up on a farm and I used to be uh, the pork queen and I have to, I'm, you know, I am leaving that past behind me and trying to, you know, quote unquote, assimilate into like, <laughs> whatever bank culture yeah. and like LA culture and stuff like that. Uh, bank culture, man. We're I'm all, an aspiring yeah. bank. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that she sees like people who are beneath her. She like perceives them as like gross. But then if we see like Mrs. Ganish is as uh, like a different version of her, that would have all worked way better than me. But instead this movie just leans into the, yeah, I, I'm Sam Raimi and I agree that old women are scary. Yeah, it's kind of presented yeah. as fact. Yeah, yes, yes. The whole movie is yeah. like shot in Raimi vision. So <laughs> you have to just like, everything is from that perception. Yeah, right. everything is cranked like up I, to 11. Mm -hmm. I, I was feeling the same way, Caitlin, of just like, I feel like it could have been, it could have been, and this would not have resolved the portrayal of Romani people in in right. this movie or you know in obviously like that not one movie is going to solve any like everything but just even like a small i was like at the funeral if we could have just seen that she was like beloved by her community or family if there had been like a moment of yeah, that you're like there's okay there's a hints lot of people of it, there but, right, right. The, in that there's people there having a good time and it seems like a sort of raucous wake but that's about all right yeah yeah but if there was just some sort of indication or like more more because I think that you know you could argue there's seed planting that the way that Allison Loman sees the people around her is really heavily skewed mm -hmm. in one direction or another. Um, but but I just yeah I feel I it, I feel like it it wouldn't have taken away from anything to just give a little more and it would have 
helped. I don't know. Also, okay, I, <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking about this in real time, but because I had never seen the movie and I didn't know what direction the story was going to go in, when, in the first few minutes, when you see the interactions between Christine and her boss and her coworker Stu, and mm-hmm. it's between the two of them for this promotion, and you see her boss and Stu be like, pretty sexist toward her where they're like yeah we don't know about you they literally say get us sandwiches yeah Yeah, get us sandwiches and yeah Yeah. we're probably gonna overlook you for the promotion in favor of this new guy who like is way more assertive than you and i was like right oh this is gonna play the game right i was like this is gonna be a story about how like she's gonna drag these dudes to hell like these people who and i like thought that was just gonna keep escalating but then all of a sudden it's about uh she's like no i still want to impress my horrible boss and i'm gonna like shame this woman in public and then i was like i was so like i got so much whiplash because of the story like the direction the story went in like i was like huh (laughs) what well we've talked about like the Evil Dead franchise is such an outlier in terms of letting the guy be the survivor, which is a thing that almost never happens in horror movies, right? Sure. There's a reason why mm-hmm. it's it's the trope is called the final girl. Right, and it's right. like, here's the dumb doofusy boyfriend who is usually the first one to get killed off. And instead, it's three movies of this guy being like – he he is cursed to live through the cycle over and over again. And as it goes mm-hmm. on, he just becomes kind of dumber and more arrogant and is punished <laughs> more and more and more. And this movie, I think, yeah, it's like setting up the type of character we're far more used to seeing at the center of a horror movie like this and then constantly playing with the allegiances and the perception of her. I think, you know, it's like, in the sense that everything's made up and he's not pulling anything from any real like mythical uh, culture or lore or whatever, it probably would have mm-hmm. helped to not make Mrs. Ganesh explicitly a Romani person. It probably would yeah. have helped if he made up a fucking fictional country and a language and used an iconography that was not already tied to a group of people that have been demonized for uh, centuries. But <laughs> right. Yeah, because she's speaking, I believe she's speaking Hungarian. That was what I read. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I think there's something, too, that, like, to this woman, the fact that Mrs. Ganush is so disgusting, right, before anything supernatural happens, there's already stuff leaking out of her, and she's putting things in her mouth, and her nails. Sure, she looks like she doesn't belong in a bank. Right. This is a bank. (laughs) Right. Right. Only, only, right, like, regular people are allowed in here. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. As you can see, I am a bank. (laughs) Um, hashtag bank culture yeah (laughs) there there is this thing of her being like well if i'm gonna reject someone it's not that bad if they're this gross you know like it's almost like she's justifying it to herself where she's like i can reject i know she's an innocent old woman who's gonna be put out but look at how disgusting she is she's like spewing gack all over my desk (laughs) (laughs) she has a thing with like I mean, I guess that in in the context of like, who am I going to pawn the button off on? Like, she seriously yes. considers giving it to an old. Like, I was like, does okay. she have? She has like yeah. an issue with old people. That's in my general, favorite scene in the she's movie. Like, let me kill this old man. <laughs> right. Yeah. Her bringing Stu in, Stu immediately getting so pathetic, and her getting angry at Stu, where it was like, I was going to fucking curse you, and now you've made me feel bad for you, you asshole. Mm-hmm. Like, she's like resentful of the fact that Stu has humanized himself to her. And then that right. long walk over to the guy on the oxygen tank at the corner of this Denny's or whatever, where she's yeah. talking herself into it. And I love that there's like no dialogue. There's no interior monologue. But you can tell what she's thinking is, look at this guy. This guy's life sucks so much. Who cares mm-hmm. if I kill him? He's already suffering so much. And then his wife comes over with a cake. And he mm-hmm. goes like, what a lovely surprise. Thank you so much. And once again, she's like, "Ugh, you made me <laughs> fucking care about this person. Yeah. Like she's angry uh-huh. when she can't write people off. And Mrs. Ganush was easy for her to write off because Mrs. Yes. Ganush grossed her out. Right. But also, right. And, but also because her job demands that she write people off, right? Like right. she has to have that mm-hmm. ability to compartmentalize whatever, her empathy to be like, well, this person just won't be able to pay their mortgage so i'm just gonna have to act in the interests of blah blah blah. you know like you know like you have to have that uh element 
of your brain, I guess, which seems to be what Sam Raimi is sort of disgusted by. Uh, and, and, you know, in the diner, she does have a mean streak. Like, she, yes. you know, when yeah. she's mean but, about tipping. Right. She's to, mean to about tipping. Yeah. And that is also, like, tied into her, what I thought was, like, the bizarro clunky body metaphor of, like, when she gets mean, she eats ice cream. And you're like, right. she has right. two Sundays. Right. Yeah. Right. It is bizarre how <laughs> threaded it is throughout the entire movie. <laughs> I'm laughing at the scene where, she, okay, so she learns that she has to pay $10,000 to do some like seance or exorcism yeah. or whatever. And she pawns off all of her items and it's only like $3,800, even though she lives in a huge house in Silver Lake and it's like, wah, wah, wah. But she's crying and eating like Turkey Hill ice cream yeah. because she like can't afford yeah. the 10000 Out of the tub. <laughs> Out of the tub, and I'm just I like, yep, like women be crying and eating ice cream. Women be crying and eating ice cream. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I think the tipping moment. Sometimes it's not only is she being an asshole about tipping, but she also like fucking like swings the envelope with the button in her face. She's like, I'll tip you this fucking button. Like she's <laughs> immediately <laughs> feeling so. That's what I'm saying. So power she jabs hungry. At her. But yeah. like power, yeah. she's like, I have the power to fuck someone over who's rude to me now. I got this button. I'm holding the hot hand. Uh, I I do think like what you're saying, David, about like it, part of this culture and David Paymer very like passively saying like you got to be more of a killer. You know, you got to be like tough in this business and whatever. I I think part of the the soup of this movie is that if the old lady who was there at that desk, who David Paymer told her to be tougher with, was Rosemary Harris as aunt may sure she wouldn't sure. be able to do yeah. it right mm -hmm. as much well, as she I, is, that there's there's groundwork for about to say. a brutal sam Raimi right. bank loan rejection scene oh yeah joel McHale is like right. joel McHale. No. she doesn't <laughs> even get the toaster that's 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 the <laughs> mean button I, he's a classic yeah. snarky asshole bank guy right mm -hmm. like yeah. he's he's fucking enjoying being like sorry you're too poor He's Whereas, like Stu, basically. Right, he's Stu. <laughs> yeah. And in this movie, it's like, I think she feels the latitude to be mean because it's just like, well, this woman isn't even human, you know? I think that's part of her being so monstrous. Now, when you tie that into the Romani shit, it's like, well, I think he's playing off the fact that that's this demonizing that's happened for a long time. But it also, unfortunately, you cannot not play into it further by linking it again. I also think that um, Sam Raimi was just like, well, I need horror imagery in my horror movie. Where yeah. can I derive that from? And he's like, well, the, I have this crone. old woman. Right. Right, yeah. exactly. So right. uh, it's just, it's unfortunate that it had to be that. Uh, I mean, he's always been such a tropey filmmaker. And I think mm -hmm. that's, he, he's leaning yeah. into every trope, right? Although I was going to say, I do think, Dalip Rao, you know, playing the what is he sort of like a spiritualist the uh, medium, yeah. right? I like his whole look. He's got like a blazer. He's got a very like confident sort of uh, like energy in this movie, like kind of quiet, sort of you know, I, I, I almost academic. I, I don't know how to. I don't know how to yeah, describe it. Yeah, that's kind of his it, vibe. Like that's like yeah, kind of the part yeah. he played. This is I feel like of of his incredible year and a half run. This is yes. like the least it's what he's doing. He, yeah, that's like what he's really good at. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, it's I don't go into a movie expecting it to be like a a Dilly Brow picture. Whatever. I, I, you never expect it because uh, James Cameron kidnapped him and no one's seen him for fifteen years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I did like that in that scene you go into it, you know, where it's clearly framed of like ah he's a fucking fraud, like he's a scammer. The and album it turns cover. Out he knows everything. Right. Yeah, oh, the album cover is this great. Is, yeah. That's what I love is that Justin Long's making these snarky fucking jokes. You see the album cover and you go like, okay, so this guy's some fucking like. Hollywood sort of wheeler dealer con artist who's trying to start his music career. And then the second D. Brow walks out of the room, you're like, no, this is just a guy with like a lot of integrity. He's right. just he like a very intelligent, yeah. soft spoken man uh, who clearly is not trying to run any scam on anybody. And Justin Long is like, 
She's like, he was real. And Justin Long's like, she's a fucking con artist. He took your money. And she's like, he didn't want to take my money. Mm -hmm. And Justin Long's like, but mm -hmm. he did ultimately, right? Like, there's this constant judgment of like, this guy can't be for fucking real. This character I saw was written to be much older. And sure. yeah. they cast Dealer More of a Brow. classic wise old guy. Right. Right. Yeah. And Rob Tapper was like, I do you think it works if the guy's this young? And he was like, he's got wisdom. Like right. Dealey Brow naturally projects a certain wisdom on screen that transcends age. And I think that's gonna work for this. And I also think it works that he's kind of a contemporary of hers. That you have to heighten it by bringing her to Adriana Barraza, and that feels like you're in a whole different realm with these sort of like wizened, aged masters of the dark arts and whatever. But that Dila Brow is just some guy who's like, "Look, just trust me, you're you're fucked." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I did one of my favorite uh, lines in the whole it. This scene is like probably under whatever when she goes back to him and he, she's like what do i do i killed the cat like what the fuck and he just very simply is like i need you to give me ten thousand dollars tomorrow and i was like okay cool very clear stakes great <laughs> and then like next scene do you guys buy that you can just dig up someone's grave put the something in their corpse's hand to be like here is a gift like like i'm gifting this to you <laughs> Like, I did not buy a single shred of any world building that happened in this movie. All of the world building was so weird. It would be like, like it was inconsistent. It didn't work. So we None can't exactly say the movie thinks it's true, but the right. movie seems to think it's right. true. Right. Yeah. If you say something is a gift, I guess that, yeah, I guess they, they didn't specify and you have to really mean it. It has to be a real right. gift. It's well, not like the kiss of true love. It's just a kiss. It didn't work as so she put the wrong envelope in her mouth. She put the coin and not the button. And if that was supposed to be a big twist that we didn't see coming, woof. I, I saw it, it coming. Really? Oh, I was. It, I, I did was, not see that coming. Oh, I, I, oh, really? oh. I was like, what? I was like, that envelope, <laughs> yeah. that coin in the envelope was planted. I'm. I. It's. It's there in my memory. I know all about it, and it's gonna be that envelope. And she's gonna mix them up, and that's gonna. That twist did not work for me. Well, at also, all. the <laughs> ske skeleton Ganoush takes some more hair. Like there are a couple things that goes. <laughs> yeah, she. That yeah, she does more. get a few right. more. Right. And doesn't she say like that's the last chunk. hair you're getting out of me? <laughs> 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 um, but no, but I like because I feel like movies will back themselves. Movies like this will back themselves into a corner where you're like, there's clearly no way to stop this. What fucking bullshit deus ex machina are you going to come up with to mm -hmm. like explain why she saved herself and averted evil or whatever? And the movie's like sort of making you think like, OK, I guess if she fucking digs up a grave and goes, I am giving this to you, and she frames it, happy birth, that, you know, whatever. If she makes, puts on the whole show of it being a gift, will that work? And then the movie goes to its artificial, like, everything's good, fucking nailed it, everything's awesome thing. And when she gets dragged to hell, I just immediately feel like, yeah, of course that didn't fucking work. Even beyond right. just giving her the wrong envelope, it's like, what a dumb plan. And I do like the <laughs> Dilip Rao pretty much from the first scene he meets her is like, you're done yeah right he's like i'm sorry i don't right. see a way out of this right yeah. <laughs> every yeah. time she goes to him he's like i have a thing i could try right. but i want you to know i think you're not running away from this mm. yeah I, and I, I i and i feel like that like ties right into her thinking that she's a good person then there's gonna be a way out of like oh well no I, I'll be able to like redeem myself because I'll just apologize to her granddaughter or like I'll do this or I'll do right. this and it's like nope Sam Raimi mm -hmm. doesn't think Sam Raimi doesn't think you can get a jacket I don't know why, why did she get a jacket at the end what is so that so that Justin Long could be like why'd you get a new jacket I found your <laughs> oh, button okay. for your old jacket and she's like no Oh yeah, you just have to. I stuffed the wrong, the wrong I envelope into the mouth of the lady. Serves her right setup. for dating such a drip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, but uh, but that's her hubris, like we like you're saying. Yeah, she's like, I surely I can. This can all be like explained away with an apology or a meeting or something like. Right, like come on, like that's how mm. that's how polite society works, right? Um. Uh, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, is there any other stuff? I really, I really like the scene with Chelsea Ross. I really like the the eye cake. The you know, 
yeah, the creepy yes. Pasadena rich family scene. Like that, 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 that's that's all perfect, like queasy, like the double layer of horror, right? Like the actual grossness of what's happening to her, and also her trying to be like, I'm trying to, you know, present well for this rich family. Like they just, I, I love that. I mean, unless I Chelsea, Chelsea Ross Rose. shows up in Doctor Strange, fingers crossed. Uh, I think this is now our final Chelsea Ross of this mini series where we've, we've shot him out a couple times, but just a thing I was thinking about with him is for a guy who is so distinctive looking, right? He, he looks like a happy otter, you know, he's got a very specific <laughs> energy. It uh-huh. is kind of incredible how much range there is and how you can use him like to put him in this movie as like this waspy blue blooded asshole and then there's like a sam raimi movie where he's like a rural kind of doofusy sheriff you know like i think he Mm. is astonishingly flexible in terms of like he works equally well at being a figure of warmth and integrity in a movie being a sort of like bureaucratic asshole being genuinely scary being a goofball being high status being low status like i just always like this guy hard agree remember him in buster scruggs he's a perfect example yeah. Great in Buster Scruggs. He's the fucking prospect. He's the trapper. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. The, right. the guy mm-hmm. with the big beard. Yeah. In the in the, the stagecoach to hell. Yeah. Right, the final one. Yeah. Yeah. Drag drag that's that that stagecoach got dragged to hell. Got dragged to hell. Uh <laughs> no, know. that whole that whole scene know. is is so good. And I do think it's I like it. this layering of the like she's getting these projections of these things that are causing her to freak out. But also even minus the supernatural Mrs. Ganush haunting, this is like her nightmare. Like she's already overheard mm-hmm. the phone conversation where her mom is still trying to set Justin Long up with other people. Mm-hmm. She's aware of how they yeah. perceive her. They think she's a bank teller. She's trying so hard to impress them. The the weirdness of the her confessing her mother being an alcoholic. Right. And then And then uh, that fixes everything for a second. I right. just, I liked I liked that scene. I a lot i like and the 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 moment where i don't know i was like oh i don't know if i've ever seen this in a movie before but it makes me feel like sometimes when i'm like on a zoom call at work uh where you're just like in another place having like a visceral nightmare and then someone is like right jamie and you have to say yes or no and it's and (laughs) and then you say the wrong answer and then the person's like what the fuck are you talking about we (laughs) did meet at a bar yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh God, that. Well, that, that's that Jamie. That's like, when you should close your eyes so your avatar disappears on Zoom. <laughs> that's that's the move. I also think we like something Jamie rabbit. did for us earlier. Yeah. We've talked. <laughs> we've talked about it already at this point, but because you weren't on that episode, I need to. I need to call out. There are the two moments in Spider-Man Two where he kind of does <gasps> that with Mary Jane doing the play, and looking at either Peter yes. not being in the seat or being in the seat. Where you mm-hmm. can't figure out if she's forgetting her line. Right. Mm-hmm. Or she's thinking about I something le- else. It's so good. Yeah. There should be a word for what that interaction is. Because it happens to me at least once a day in any like writer's room where I'm just like, I just am in another place for a second. And then all of a sudden, it's I, I am delivering a wrong answer that I'm guessing. I think you should just do what I do. And I say... I'm so sorry. I was not paying attention to you at all. Can you please repeat what you said? <laughs> yeah, but you have to emphasize at all. Yeah. At, at all. all. At a little all. bit. And then continue to be like, because I don't because take I think you you're boring. seriously. Right. And, yeah. Um, My deepest apologies, that, it, but I fundamentally do not give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it works every time. This, I have so many friends. Yes. Uh, the, the other, by the way, we we talked about it briefly, but the other sign of her uh, villainy is just that she's like, make a sacrifice. She kills a cat she yes, kills pretty a cat. much right away. She, she kills, kills a, cat. a cat. Which I do yeah. appreciate Sam Raimi breaking the holy rule of right. screenwriting or whatever, where he's like, she, she's not going to save a cat. She's going to kill a cat basically on screen. Basically Basically, at the drop of a hat. And then all cats know because the ne- yeah. the next cat she encounters is mad at her. I, I, I like that like, yeah, every like, cat fuck can you. tell. Hecubit That's maybe like, yeah, yeah, yeah. my Blood single on your favorite hands. Alison Lohman performance <laughs> moment in the entire film is when she's like, weird, I, I usually love, get along great with cats. I had a cat. And she, it just hangs <laughs> there. And Justin Long's like, yeah. have, we you have, have a cat. 
unless something happened to her. And he says it like a joke and she just stares at him for like five seconds and then says, well, I don't know. You can't keep track of things. Who knows what's happened while we're gone? Yeah. And cats, they come and go. <laughs> it was good. Her weirdly defensive. Yeah. Yeah. And I just like the way, as you said, Jamie, like admitting that her mother is an alcoholic, a thing that terrifies Justin Long that he thinks his parents are going to judge her for immediately fixes the situation for five seconds. And then when she right. freaks out, and he runs after her. The first thing his mom says is like, she's crazy. There's nothing to fix there. Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. it feels like obviously she's had this blow up, but immediately the fact that she admits that alcoholism runs in her family is being weaponized against her. Mm -hmm. Like the right. second she does something uncouth, it's like, well, but she's a crazy person. Which is like another way that uh, that Allison Loman. I mean, I even in the space of this conversation, I've ping ponged back and forth so much and like how I feel about her. But you do get that like that element of like she's like the in but like she she is going into this Pasadena situation being like I'm poor like I'm not being taken seriously because of my class but then she's doing the same shit to Mrs. Ganoush by being like oh ew poor <laughs> let me just you know like right. deny and but she doesn't seem to understand that at all like you know it's like being from a lower class is only sympathetic when it's her that is right. coming from a lower class. And right. with everyone else, it's gross and her behavior is justified. Like, I like that. Right. You want to vault out of it and pretend you were never. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't want right. to act like you're one of them. Or there, there's a lot know. of like uh, Starly in our gift episode was talking about mm. um, how there's that aspect of of Raimi liking to torture people, right? That like so much of his filmmaking was based around the idea of fucking with his best friend on camera, right? And what are funny things I can get this big galoof uh, Bruce to do on camera, who was always just like ready and willing and able and all of that. And then he loves sort of like fucking with his audience in a similar kind of way. And rewatching Spider-Man 2 in particular, I'd forgotten how much that movie is just like the entire universe fucking with Peter Parker, just right. nonstop. Yeah. Like anytime that character bends down to tie his shoes, a backpack hits him, you know, like he just <laughs> yeah. he loves putting a character at the center of the movie who we can sort of just throw shit at and make look stupid and whatever. But I think very often they're sort of like they're naive you know they're they're sort yeah. of too innocent or they're hubris or whatever it is and i think this movie is playing such an interesting game with constantly trying to get you to question the morality of this woman how bad what she did is what is the appropriate punishment for this the scenes that totally push you away from her where you're like i hate this person the scenes like you're talking about jamie before a moment you're like fuck i really relate to what she's doing here you know, and just constantly playing that game of identifying. There's been so much, like, I feel, um, uh, tweeting I've seen recently about Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi. I think largely because everyone's just fucking amped that there's a new Sam Raimi movie and we're all hoping it's good. Uh, but um, there's this one tweet I saw that I just think is, like, perfect that I just want to read. Uh, the, the user's Danny Vegito. And it's, it's like uh, uh, written like a script. He's Bruce Campbell, wistfully. Sam is my oldest friend. I can't imagine my life without him. Sam Raimi. Once a month, I feed Bruce some poison mushrooms and nurse him back to health. As soon as he recovers, <laughs> we go for a walk in the woods and I kick him in the dick. <laughs> and then the follow-up tweets are, Sam Raimi is Bugs Bunny and Bruce Campbell is his daffy. Bruce Campbell, bleeding out of his skull. Hey, Sammy boy, I was thinking maybe I could do an adult drama or something, maybe with another director. Raimi, nice try. Do another flip, clown. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Sam Raimi does always seem a little bashful in these interviews where he's like, I really dumped a lot of worms on Allison. I hope she's not mad at me. Like, you know, like he does have that, like, like that sort of Midwestern embarrassment about it all. Yeah. But yes, he, he is always like, look, I mean, I gave them the script and I mean, I hope they read it because, yeah, they, a lot of not but nice things are going to happen. Right. I guess he, well, he, he did. He, he did eventually. Yeah. yeah. Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, before they, before they, uh, before they made it, he gave but the day I, of shooting, yeah. The day yeah. of shooting, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> after the premiere, he let them read the script. No, I do. I think there's that like fundamental shift where it's like there was something just so perfect about the Ramey Campbell dynamic where you sense that these guys were best friends. You sense that Bruce Campbell was like ready for anything, that he sort of was a glutton for punishment. 
where like you purely feel joy at watching this guy go through this shit. As awful as it is, <laughs> it does feel like Bugs Bunny fucking with Daffy Duck, right? Right. Yeah. And sure. this is a movie mm -hmm. that's like digging into the weirdness of the Raimi torturing the character, torturing the audience thing a little bit more and questioning like, what are you rooting for here? Do you want her to be saved? And if so, why? But also, are you paying money to try to see this woman get barfed on a lot? Is part of the premise, the <laughs> promise of a horror movie that you want to see horrible things happen to this person? And if so, why? Like, he's asking right. both things at the same time, which I think is really interesting. And I do think that M Mrs. Ganesh is like a really like, Re I mean, especially because of like the specific year that this movie came out in, it's really easy to like be rooting for Mrs. Ganesh to yeah. just like kick the shit out of the Allison Lohman character because of who she is, like, or what she not who she is, who she like, what she represents is like the, mm -hmm. the banal evil in 2009. It's like, yeah, that's the anyone who's like symbolic of bank loans we want to see get dragged to hell in that specific year um mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know i just think it's wild that it came out when it did it's insane i i do agree yeah. with you that i feel like the movie could benefit from like especially in the sort of mrs ganush memorial scene someone revealing some side of her that we haven't seen like you want to hear from her mm -hmm. granddaughter or someone some testimonial of like Someone's saying to Alison Lohman's face, you think she's this gross old fucking puking, like, uh, creepy crawlers woman. Like, she's right. like a human being. Like, here's like, she loaned mm -hmm. me a dollar, you know? But instead, everyone in that scene, too. Right, right. Yes. No, everyone in that scene, it feels like the fucking Hunchback of it's Notre like, Dame. We, right, 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 right. It's like... The Disney yeah. Hunchback of Notre Dame where they're having the party Which, in the sewers. Right, another whatever. very considerate movie towards Romani people. Yes. Right, exactly. It's yeah. like, look at the people from this other culture. Right. And it, let's double down on how we think it's weird. Right. It's all super vague, yeah. I, I like the whiplash of her going in there thinking she's going to be able to apologize to this woman and walking into a party and then seeing a dead body. And I like it <laughs> puking all over her, the embalming <laughs> fluid. I do just think somewhere in between there you want someone. And maybe it is the granddaughter at the door rather than just being like, fuck you, you former Maybe. fatty. Right. right. You do right. want her right. to be like – she was like a human being. She's not some yeah. like – Right. And this Some, is her house. Right. Yeah. She, you know, do, you, she what doesn't just take from her. Exist in relation to you. You're coming here to try to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Which she is. I mean, and and to stop being dragged to hell. But right. she does get dragged to hell. She does she's get dragged, dragged to, hell. to hell. It doesn't. She work. gets. Uh, she falls onto the train tracks and then she's dragged on into hell and her face so turns into a hell. skeleton. Yeah. Right before mm -hmm. uh, she goes yeah. down and then the screen goes black and it says "Drag me to hell." And that's the end of the movie. Love that. Before love that. we play, I love that too. Before I we play the box yeah. office game, is there anything else we have not, you know, any other bit we haven't mentioned? Well, anything, to, that, you know? to that point, what you just said, David, I read an interview with Raimi where someone asked him, like, have you ever thought about making a sequel to Drag Me to Hell? And he was like, I mean, it ends with her being dragged to hell. I don't really know yeah, what, what you... you <laughs> would it just be called um, hell? Like she's pitch? in hell? Yeah. Drag me from hell. Ooh. Hey, just Ooh. you're in hell. It has to and you're like, am I am I nice dragon. to someone? Yeah, so drag nice. me around hell. Yeah, oh, sure. Just it's a long. trilogy. Drag me to hell. Drag me around hell, and then drag me from hell. Yeah. Wow. Drag me across mm -hmm. hell. <laughs> Justin Long has to do 100 good deeds, and then Allison Lohman can come out of retirement, stop talking about Bitcoin, and emerge from hell, <laughs> where she was banished. <laughs> the sequel to this right, movie is yeah. My Name is Earl, but with Justin Long trying to oh. <laughs> do See, little mitzvahs I, for name, people. My Name is Earl makes way more sense. I was thinking of that Nickelodeon show, 100 Good Deeds for Eddie oh, McDowell, oh, sure. where, the, where the dog wants to be a boy again. Right. Or a right. man? I forget. I think it was a boy i think it was like a young man it's another thing i, I like about this movie is i do i do like that they are like young adults like they are not teenagers yeah. they're not college sure. students they're also not like 45 <laughs> they are not 45 they're not That's 45 true. they're famously not 45 in this movie they might be 45 now i don't really know david mm -hmm. I, th I think we tried our hardest to not make uh, this podcast too horny 
Uh, sure, you try. I think. Look, both of us understand that this is, uh, you know, this, this the, the the podcast audience has grown, and maybe not everyone wants to hear us a wooging all the time. Okay. Getting thirsty on Maine. Mm hmm. So please accept my apologies in advance for what I'm about to do. Okay. Ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. It's a sound that turns you on most, David. What's that? I do love that sound. It's, uh, you know, the sound of another sh- sale on Shopify. It is. It is. The, it, the four sexiest words in the English language. Another sale on Shopify. Shopify is an all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. And we use it. Mm-hmm. We use it to sell merch. We use it to sell spatulas. That's true. We do use it to sell shirts and comedy point coins and all that, but also Mm -hmm. spatulas. And that's because Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Yeah, you can reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. All great companies that have done nothing wrong for society. And, and you gain insights, David, as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. So just go to shopify.com slash check, all lowercase for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash check right now. Right now. Shopify.com slash check. That's it. Bye. Griffin, when did this film come out? Do you know? I can tell you. It came out June 2009? May 29th, 2009. Wow. Memorial Uh, Day weekend. end End of May. Yep. Memorial Day weekend. I was trying uh, to find it, anything to support this, and I couldn't. So maybe it was created in my brain. But my memory was that this was a thing that they had on like a less desirable release date, and then they got so bullish of how it played at festivals and at test screenings that they pushed it up to like a primetime summer date, and there it, it kind of couldn't. But you're saying you don't the competition. Know if that's true. No, I might be confusing it with like I know there were a lot of examples of this at that time where like Land of the Dead, the George Romero movie was supposed to come out in Halloween and they were like, fuck it, 4th of July. And then it performed (laughs) like a George Romero movie on the 4th of July. Right. But no, no, because this film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival uh, a mere week before its release. And Uh, they screened it unfinished at South by Southwest. Yes. Right. Yes. Hmm. Um, and it went it over opens... really well. It got good reviews, and then people were like, "Why is this making less money than most horror movies?" Right. It, well, it, it opened to fifteen million dollars. It made forty-two domestic, ninety-one worldwide. So yeah, mm-hmm. it did yeah, kind of right. You would think it could do a little better, just as like I think the summer release hurts it in that regard. I think so just, too. I th- it's tougher that's what... to compete. Yeah, yeah. Most of those Ghost of House movies came out in like January, February, yeah, yeah. or September. Right. And we've been asking for so long, like, why didn't Raimi make more movies like this? I think he felt kind of defeated by the fact that where he's like, this didn't even do as well as The Messengers, that movie I produced that no one fucking thinks about. It, it did better than The Messengers. That's surprising to hear. I mean, maybe it was because I was like in this in high school when this movie came out, but I felt like everyone I knew had seen Drag Me to Hell. Except for we me, all and saw then it. I saw it. Us, us yeah. youngsters, right? Yeah. yeah, I guess. I guess the kids no one else did. wanted to see Alice and Loman dragged absolutely to hell, and we got what we wanted. <laughs> kids only care and about one thing, and that's that's it's the problem with our disgusting. generation. We get everything yeah. we want. Us, <laughs> yeah. us dang a participation we are. trophy. Right. Alice and Loman being dragged to hell. <laughs> Num- everything else in here is a blockbuster, basically. Like everything else is a big movie. Number one at the box office yeah. is a film for children, uh-huh. um, but it's one of those, you know, movies that everybody saw and it got a Best Picture nomination. Uh, it's the motion picture Up. It's uh, Up in its first yeah. weekend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Up. Okay. Um, which is not my favorite uh me neither. Pixar movie. And anytime I say that, people go, why do you hate Up? And I'm like, I don't hate <laughs> it. I just don't think it's as good as the other ones. I, I don't know. What do you guys think Ooh. of Up? It, it's the one where I just really felt my buttons being pushed and I was sort of like, I'm not That's even That's what I don't, I don't appreciate know. about. I felt my I buttons don't... being stolen and put a curse on. <laughs> exactly. I watch just, Up. You know, exactly. I felt like, yeah, I felt like a button was being put in my jaw and then they kicked my jaw shut and they said, yeah. 
happy birthday, bitch, or whatever she says. <laughs> Made out uh, with my chin. That's what it feels like when I see the first scene in that. I don't like, because it's the thing, I, if a movie tells me to cry, I will cry, but then I'll also feel like deep resentment because I'm yeah. just easily manipulated. I like Monsters Incorporated. Uh, yeah, Monsters Incorporated <laughs> fucking rules. Me too. Yeah. Uh, that one's good. Yeah. Perfect movie. Um, yeah. But I've literally not. I've also never rewatched up. I've never had the desire. Whatever. It's it's it, not, it's, it's not it is yeah. one of the ones I rewatch the least. For someone who rewatches four yeah, Pixar like movies the, a day, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, number two at the box office is uh, it's a it's a sequel fi- film. Terminator it's Salvation. No, no, it's no. a family sequel. Okay, it's Night uh, the Museum. But you just guessed number three. Number three. Okay. Night the Museum Battle for the Smithsonian. Yeah. That's right. I it's, remember this weekend. Pre- yeah. It's a pretty dire time. I'm yeah. not, I, you know, I mean, there's good stuff in this, but like, you know, this is the, this sort of the Marvel era is also, you know, uh, you know, one dimensional and we keep getting yeah. the same movie all the time. But like this late 2000s thing where they were like, more Night in the Museum? Like, you know, we're kind of like, no, that's, uh, you know, like, like it, it wasn't great. No. Uh, is this the second? The Smithsonian is the second night of that's the museum? That's the second. That's the Amy Adams one. She's Amelia Earhart? Yeah. Oh, right. It, it's a perfect God. example of that thing Roger Ebert used to say, where, like, when I watch a movie with a great cast, or I don't even think he, he limits it to a great cast, but he says, when I watch a movie, I always ask myself, is watching this film more or less entertaining than watching this exact cast of actors have dinner would be? Mm. Ooh, mm. that's a fun yardstick. Right? Like, right. It, the and effort so they're putting like into this. Stiller, Amy Adams, Owen Wilson, Robin Williams, Hank Azaria, Christopher but this is the Guest. Thing. The, right, right. You know, the like, new... Ooh, right. John Bernthal's in this? This is what I'm saying. Mm. The, the new additions for two are like Bernthal, Adams, Christopher Guest, Bill Hader, uh, Alice yeah. Shabbat, Famous French comedian Alain Chabat. Uh, Rami Malik. Rami though. Malik's back. Uh-oh. Dick Rami Van Dyke. Yeah, early Malik. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, apparently George Foreman is in this film too. I don't remember. Uh, no, sure. Apparently he's playing himself. Uh, so, famous museum exhibit, George Foreman. <laughs> yeah, like number famously th- at the museum. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> he just has the grill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and number number three is Terminator Salvation, Terminator Salvation which is yeah. which is a real bummer of a Terminator movie. I guess yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, which yeah. one is which that? Which sucks. That's it's the, the one... Christian Bale one. McGee oh, directed okay. Sam Worthington. It's all Mick just future G. war stuff. Yeah, it's McGee. It's a McGee movie. It's the only uh, one with out. It's a McJoint. Arnold. Right, there's no Arnold Schwarzenegger. Although they have weird, creepy CGI naked CGI Arnold. Arnold, yeah, right. I do remember right. that. It, it's just, Anton Yelkin is also in that one? Anton's yes, really is, good in it, He actually. is Kyle Reese. Mm-hmm. He is good. Yes. I remember him yeah. being the only performance that kind of pops in it, and that movie is so wildly unfun. Yeah. Late 2000s reboot culture is all kind of uniquely joyless and weird and but I think, sad. right, because they're learning they're learning the wrong lessons the from Christopher the Christopher Nolan again, shit. Yes. Where they're yes. like, right, yeah. so it should be completely realistic right. with no fun. Is that, right. is that what we want? Like, like <laughs> that's, not, that's not the idea. Like, but yeah, I don't know. That movie is think... uniquely bad. Also, McG is, uh, is a horrible match for anything for grim and gritty. Choice. Like, yeah, <laughs> like if, if anything, you want that guy to be making the stupidest movie yeah. of all time. You don't want to make something that's like where people are going to cry. Like, uh, the, anyway. Yeah, he made the stupidest movie of all time. It's called Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, and it rules. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, number four is Drag Throttle. Me to Hell. Okay. Number five is another reboot uh, which features Anton Yelkin, but it's Fuck. a good one. Oh, it's Star Trek. It's Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, and then, but then to, to continue mm. with down this list, Angels mm-hmm. and Demons. No. Oh. Uh, you know, <laughs> Dance Flick. Dance Flick is that, that's a spoof movie, right? That's, da- that's Damon spoofing. Wayne's uh, Jr. Dance Flicka. Um, Dance also Flicka. The biggest five comedy <laughs> with <laughs> X Men Origins Wolverine. Like, this is, this is dire stuff. These were dire yeah. offerings. Caleb and then Wolf- Ghosts of Girlfriends Past and Obsessed is the rest of the top 10. Uh, Caleb- oh, I saw what Obsessed. Were, what you, were you going to say the problem is? I was going to say the biggest problem with Angels and Demons is mm. that Alfred Molina does not reprise not his role. In it. He's not back. <laughs> not in it. He's not As Bishop Aaron Garosa. They should have brought him back for Angels and Demons and let him take his shirt off. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that would have solved all the problems I, I had I, with Angels and Demons. I, I, I love 
Alfred Molina. I truly forgot he was in the Da Vinci Code. Who is he in the Da Vinci Code? He plays. He's uh, one of the priests. He's like a yeah. bishop or something. He's a bishop or something. Yeah. Okay. He's one of the I just remember guys. I remember seeing the trailer for Angels and Demons a thousand times, and I had seen the Da Vinci Code, and I did not enjoy it. But mm-hmm. the trailer, if you remember, it just has like the word Illuminati with like lightning yes. flashing, <laughs> and Tom Hanks is like, "We got to get them." And I was just like, "I'll see this," and then I never did. Like it was uh. so despised <laughs> that I I never even bothered. But I was like, I, I was on board for Tom Hanks fighting the Illuminati. Man, in, I in watched- theory. I watched yeah. it in the pandemic for the first time and I could not believe yeah. how boring it was. Like it, it was just so, so uninvolving. Yeah. But but you're yeah. right, Caitlin, that they should have taken a lesson a little further down on the box office charts. And rather than just adapting another Robert Langdon book, they should have done, uh, excuse me here, let me get this right. Da Vinci Code, Origins, Bishop Arangarosa. And Angarosa. Bishop Arangarosa, <laughs> the squeakquel. <laughs> The and that would have gotten butts in seats. Yeah, it would have gotten um, at least a butt in a seat. Yes, one butt. <laughs> Jamie, but it is. Um, it is funny. It feels like the two things that fucked everything up for a couple of years there were Batman Begins and uh, Born Ultimatum, or Bo- right, Born, then, uh, yeah, Born yeah. whatever. And the then, second and then one. Marvel sweeps in, and everyone's yeah. like, "Oh, we'll just try this." It's not like that's better. I'm just right. saying that mm. this was also a sort of weird studio scrambling to be like what is it you people want you know like but i think every you look at like star trek is actually yeah. doing well that summer right. and it's because people are like oh this thing's fun and the next minute right. is adorable. like cry for me <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> uh anyway that's 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 it we're done Griff. wow we did it <laughs> Wow. We did it. Wow. We talked. We we dragged. We got dragged to hell. We're we all in hell. We got dragged now. to hell. And we, We're I think we dragged here. some other people to hell in the process. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Jamie, Caitlin, thank you so much for coming back. Thank oh, you. Thanks so for much having for us. dragging us to hell. We'll get dragged to hell with you anytime yeah, you want. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, drag us yeah, back, baby. Good to know. We'll drag okay. you back. Um, <laughs> do you have anything you want to plug aside from obviously the Bechdel cast? Jamie, you've got a thing. There, thank you, thank you for teaming me up. <laughs> I, I've got, <laughs> I've got a, amazingly, I've got a new uh, limited series podcast that is uh, coming out through the end of June uh, called Ghost Church. That is about American spiritualism. Actually, pretty fitting, like pretty, hmm. yeah, pretty kind of yeah. on theme with Drag Me to Hell. I yeah. I kept my little mouth shut about it, but yeah, the the seance scene in this movie <laughs> is uh is interesting. Uh, but yeah, it's all about American spiritualism, and I uh, spent a week with some mediums in Florida, and so it's about that. If you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, there's exactly one show about it, and uh, I made it. Hell yeah! All all your all your shows are are, are so great, Jamie. I mean, also oh, relevant, but you did your incredible uh, Lolita series, and we're getting mm. ready to uh, do yeah. Stanley Kubrick this summer, mm. and that is very I much mean, a movie I am dreading talking about, and will be probably uh, re-listening to Jamie your episodes back. several times. Guys, Look, if you really want to drag me back to hell, uh, tra- I've got Jamie, if you want to be in hell, Jamie, let sir, us know. seriously, yeah. we had the conversation, and our question was: d- Does she did ever want to talk it? about Lolita ever again? <laughs> Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I would, I would happily. I mean, not happily, but I would. I would be. I'm always happy to talk, uh, Lolita. Well, we'll we'll talk Good about talking about Lolita. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What we talk about when we talk about Lolita. Sorry, shouldn't have said that. <laughs> shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Annoying. Uh, yes. Uh, anything else, guys? Anything C- else you want? Caitlin, anything you want to plug? Yeah. Um, I teach screenwriting classes. If mm-hmm. if you want to check those out, and uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, just listen to the Bechdel. Ca- Excuse me, I'm getting dragged to hell in that <laughs> moment. Um, <laughs> listen to the Bechdel. <laughs> Meanwhile, I get dragged to hell. <laughs> oh yeah, you Sorry, I'm spitting up, up goo. Um, and uh, and now I'm done spitting up my goo. Okay, please listen to the Bechdel cast and. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, follow us on social media. I'm at Caitlin Durante on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, yeah, and I'm at, at Jamie Loftus Health or at Jamie Gray Superstar. You figure out which is which. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you both for being here. Thanks and for having us, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, uh, all 
and now I'm shifting who I'm speaking to, the listener, for listening. Uh, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media. Uh, thank you to Leigh Montgomery and the Great American Owl for our theme song, Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork, JJ Birch for our research, Alex Barron and AJ McKeon for our editing. Uh, you can go to blankcheckpod.com for all sorts of nerdy shit, links to all our things, including uh, uh, our Patreon, patreon.com slash blankcheck, blankcheck special features uh, where we do commentaries on franchises and we're doing hashtag not all Batman, all the Batman movies we haven't previously covered in the past. Um, yep. Tune in next week for Oz the Great and Powerful, everyone's favorite Sam Raimi movie. We have finally gotten Whoa. to the movie that everyone always identifies with Sam Raimi. <laughs> Feels like the <laughs> peak of just his voice as an artist. A movie that mm. definitely exists and is beloved. Um, <laughs> so very excited to talk about that. David, you've never seen it. Um, I have never seen it. Uh, get ready. I didn't want to because nobody yeah. liked it. Well, get ready for it to make a major impact on you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> super excited. Uh, for Oz the Great and Powerful. Yeah, it's the Raimi I've never seen. But God, here we go. Thank you for thank you for not uh, making us watch that. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes, thank you. Anytime. Oz blessed. That, that's, that's actually dragging someone to hell is asking them. Hey, just, <laughs> is the true drag me to hell. <laughs> just want to gauge your interest in appearing on an Oz the Great and Powerful episode. Anyway, <laughs> tune in next week. I think we'll have a great guest for that. Uh, and as always, uh, this movie, just uh, talking about this made me open up a new tab. So I just want to read for you a quick list of uh, Mattel Gak products from 1992 to present Ooh. Mm -hmm. GAC okay. GAC in the dark solar GAC which changes color when exposed to sunlight smell Do my GAC Okay. Uh, well, we're, uh, let's see if we get there. Smell My Gek okay. had flavors such as pickles, flowers, vanilla ice cream, hot dog, pepperoni pizza, baby powder. You could get a Gak pack, a Gak vac, Gak's Alive, Gak Inflator, Gak Copier, Gakoids, Gak Color Mixer, Gak Splat, Gak Super Stretch, Mood Gak, Gak Twisted, Galacted Gak. Then we go to Floam, Floam Sports and Floam and Flight, mm -hmm. Floam Shape Shop, Floam Factory, Flo Floam Era. Kit, Go Floam, <laughs> Floam Dome, Zog Log, Smud, Squand, <laughs> Zand, Goose. Sorry, everyone on the call has a nosebleed right now. <laughs> Gak Splat Balls, Slime, Smatter, Squeeze, My dentures Splish are coming out. Splat, Zyra Floam. Zyra Floam. Oh. How do you know when you've entered your Floam era? You've exited your Gag era, you've entered your Floam well, era. It's, it was it's truly, great, it's, it was a vibe shift. It's a great change. It was a true vibe shift. <laughs>